34. Good evening. Within the next few months, there'll be a general election. You will choose who leads the country for the next five years. But millions of you in England and Wales have been voting today to decide who's in charge of bins, care and crime where you live. Those decisions make a huge difference, but the results will give us a massive indicator of our politicians' fortunes as we hurtle towards the big contest. The Prime Minister's tried to look cheerful on the campaign, but he's been under the cosh for many months. If the results are gruesome, could Rishi Sunak's job even be at risk? Will Sir Keir Starmer be able to show convincing progress tonight? Labour's been miles ahead in the polls for months, but it's real life votes that really matter. Ed Davey and his army of Lib Dem activists want to call time on the Tories, but in how many parts of the country will they actually get their way? Thousands of council seats are up for grabs. There's a by-election in Blackpool. Police commissioners are being chosen too, and there are elections for those powerful mayors around the country. It adds up to the biggest test of public opinion before the general election. And Rita Chakrabarti will bring us the numbers as the hours tick by. These are the seats that the main parties are defending. Just under 1,000 for the Conservatives and for Labour, just over 400 for the Liberal Democrats. Counting overnight are 641 local council seats on 35 English councils. There'll be three police and crime commissioners and also that House of Commons seat of Blackpool South. I'll be bringing you the results and looking at the figures and the trends behind them. Of course, the nation's number cruncher, Professor Sir John Curtis, will explain how the landscape is shaping up. And our political editor, Chris Mason, will tell us what that could mean. Top politicians from the parties will be with us in the studio with smiles or perhaps brave faces as the night goes on. So stay with us for election night on the BBC. The results are about to start coming in. A very warm welcome to election night on the BBC. Now, there is a dizzying array of contests to keep our eyes on. Each race, of course, important in its own right. But in this feverish atmosphere in the months before a general election, the overall picture we can build as the night goes on is so vital. Now, there are two things we have to bear in mind. The last time these seats were up was in 2021, when Boris Johnson was in charge. And it's not so much election night, but election 48 hours. It's going to take a while for all of the results to come in. So we'll know a lot by 6 a.m. in the end of our time together, but not everything. One of the most important races, though, is the by-election result at Blackpool South. We'll be there on the ground in a few minutes, and we will have that result this evening. We'll, of course, be right round the country with our colleagues at Counts. And at the desk with us for the first part of the night, the Cabinet Minister, Chris Heaton-Harris, for the Conservatives, Bridget Phillipson, who wants to be Labour's next Education Secretary, and Manira Wilson, her opposite number in the Liberal Democrats. I wonder who's feeling nervous and who's feeling chipper. But first off, let's start with our political editor, Chris Mason. And just as we look at pictures of what's starting to come in in Blackpool South, talk to us first about what is at stake here for the Prime Minister and his Conservative colleagues. For the Prime Minister, it is all about managing, in the short term at least, to convince his own MPs that he is definitively the person to take their party into the general election. Because for those small number of quite vociferous Conservative MPs who are not of that view, they acknowledge privately this is the last opportunity that they will have if the results are poor, bad for the Conservatives, to convince their colleagues that this might be the moment to make a move. They acknowledge that they will have a persuasion job to do that because of the magnitude, the nuclear option of mm. yet another uh, change uh, of Prime Minister. But that's what's at stake here in the very short term for the Prime Minister because it's that last chance before the general election for those who would like to see a change to make that argument and try and convince their colleagues of the merits of that argument as they see it. So if by Saturday afternoon it looks really gruesome, then the jeopardy is massive for Rishi Sunak. 
Let's then think of the Labour Party, and we're seeing the count in Hartlepool. Now, in 2021, mm. the Tories won the by-election there, hugely successful for Keir Starmer and his colleagues. What does he have to show in places like that? Hartlepool is fascinating because it is a case study in political change in relatively short term over the last three years. So I, I remember being there, actually, at the Hartlepool by-election. Labour lost. Boris Johnson was in his pomp. There was a giant inflatable of Boris Johnson that was sort of paraded through the, the town on the, on the day. And Keir Our Starmer... Are rolling their eyes there at that particular memory. And, and Keir Starmer <laughs> was in real trouble. And actually, we've learned since in a biography by Tom Baldwin, former Labour uh, communications director, former journalist, that Keir Starmer that weekend came close to resigning as Labour leader. That's how imperiled he was by that... Result. And at the same time, in that wider region, the Tees Valley, the Conservatives won the mayoral race mm -hmm. there by a million, <clears throat> a million miles, more than 70% of the vote. So it's an indicator that of how political fortunes have shifted in the last few years. And for tonight, for the Labour Party, they are looking not just at something that looks credible, but something that looks really convincing. I mean, we're seeing pictures there of Rushmore in Hampshire. Mm. Now, a council in Hampshire which might have seemed unimaginable a few years, that is in Labour's sight. So the whole, the whole picture for Labour, what do they want to happen? They've got to be able to convince themselves and then shape a conversation that implies that they are en route to winning a general election. We've seen opinion polls, haven't we, for months on end mm. with Labour a million miles ahead. But we should always emphasise the colossal mountain yeah. that Labour are trying to climb at that general election. And as any politician will acknowledge, you know, opinion polls, of course they matter and they shape the mood, but real Real votes in real ballot boxes really matter. How does geographically the results tonight match, and this is the same for all of the parties, match the key seats come the general election? Interestingly, from Labour this evening, their absolute emphasis is on Blackpool South, that parliamentary by-election, which they think they're going to win, and the council elections, they are emphasising less the mayoral contests Conservatives equal and opposite on that, with them leaning into pointing at those mayoral contests as something they say suggests that their fate is perhaps not as grim as some might have feared. Now, a bit later, I want to ask you about the smaller parties, because mm. local elections are really important for them. But let's then go straight to Blackpool South. That's where Labour are emphasising they're really hopeful of success tonight. Um, that seat is up for grabs because the former Conservative MP, Scott Benson, had to quit in disgrace, really, but Helen Katz is there for us tonight. Then, Helen, what are the prospects for this result? Well, it's not just Labour, I think, who are confident that this seat is turning red tomorrow. They're certainly very confident of winning it, but speaking to the other parties here as well, I mean, they're pretty sure that it's going to be a Labour win too. So all the focus here really is on what the scale of that will be. Now, Labour are hoping for something above a 12.5% swing here because they say that would then translate into a, a majority at a general election. There's also a lot of focus on how reform perform here. The Brexit Party came third here. Uh, it's sort of forerunner to reform in, in 2019 with about 6% of the vote. It does look like they are on course to do better than that this time. They believe they've had a pretty good day at the polling stations today, better so than, than they have perhaps in the postal ballots. Now, neither they nor the Conservatives at this stage think that they have done enough to push the Conservatives down into third place. The Tories, by the way, are privately acknowledging that they think they've lost this too, that they, but they still think they're going to come in second. At the moment, though, it's very difficult to tell. And, Helen, what kind of time do you think the result will come in there in Blackpool South? And any indication of turnout, how much people were infused by this by-election? And there's no indication of turnout yet, but certainly various party sources I've been speaking to have been worried that turnout, turnouts could be quite low here. They say that there's a, a bit of a, a background of that. Uh, so we don't have turnout yet. And in fact, the count hasn't even started here yet. We've got all the ballot boxes in. We think they're all here, uh, but verification is, is still happening. So we haven't yet got into the counting. The original time frame we were given for a declaration here was sometime between 2 and 5 in the morning. I think they were thinking it might fall more in the middle of that. But again, as I said, they haven't started counting yet. So until that is underway, we can't give you a better steer on that, unfortunately. OK, Helen, thanks so much for now. And we'll be back with you shortly through the night. Interesting there, Helen, being very clear. Labour and the Tories whispering that they think the seat has gone to Labour and the Conservatives acknowledging to Helen and other people on the ground that they expect to have lost that seat. I'm going to talk to our politicians about that in just a couple of minutes. But, Rita, 
let's then think about these council elections because they're right across England. They're not in Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland, but talk us through the ones that we're going to have our BDI eyes on in the next few hours. We've got quite a few coming in, Laura. About a third of all the councils are counting overnight and these are some of the ones that we're going to be keeping an eye on. We've arranged them, as you can see, in terms of which of the main parties were defending which council. Under the Conservatives, Reading is their most marginal council. They have a majority of, uh, of, of three there. Redditch, I beg your pardon. Um, Redditch is in the West Midlands and that is being heavily targeted by Labour. Rushmore, which is in Hampshire. Now, this has been Conservative since the start of the century, since the year 2000. Uh, but Labour has been nibbling away at Conservative support there. And Labour got five seats there last year. So we'll be watching Rushmore carefully as well. And Harlow in Essex, the Conservatives took this from Labour. Can Labour take the fight back this time round? Under the Labour column, Oldham is the most marginal uh, Labour uh, council and we'll be watching Oldham with a lot of interest because we're waiting to see whether the leadership's policy on Gaza is going to have some effect there. You'll remember that in neighbouring Rochdale in the by-election just a few weeks ago, Labour lost a lot of support and went on to lose the by-election. It was thought largely because of that reason. So we'll be looking at Oldham, Lincoln, Reading, Exeter, all interesting contests. Under the Lib Dem column, well, Hull is a Lib Dem Labour fight. Uh, the Lib Dems might have a, quite a fight on their hands to hang on to Hull. Winchester, Eastleigh and Gosport, they're all in Hampshire and Gosport is the Lib Dems' most uh, marginal council. So let's see what happens there. Now, in terms of the hung council, so these are where there's no, no one party in overall, uh, overall control. This might be the most exciting because most of the councils tonight are up in thirds, which means it's only one in three seats that's being counted. That means it's quite difficult for a council to change hands. But of course, a hung council is by its very nature volatile. So Hartlepool, what will happen there? Labour targeting that very strongly. And of course, they lost that famous, notorious for them, by-election to the Conservatives back in 2021. Uh, they're short, they're short by two seats uh, for a majority in Hartlepool. They're short by six in Thurrock. That is a straight Labour Conservative fight. The Conservatives are two seats short of a majority there. And for the Lib Dems, they're targeting Portsmouth uh, and also Stockport in Greater Manchester. So a lot of results to come in and we'll be bringing you them, of course, as they do. Laura. Rita, thank you very much indeed. It's a really good reminder of just how complicated a jigsaw this is, but especially in an election year, every single council you've talked about, every single seat is so important for parties to infuse their foot soldiers to be able to get them pounding the pavements during an election year. Let's turn then to our politicians and let's zoom into Blackpool South. So we heard from our colleague Helen Catt on the ground there that Conservative sources and Labour sources on the ground, Chris Eaton Harris, are acknowledging that you have lost the seat. Are you ready to acknowledge that? Um, well, I think it's a really, it's definitely a tough seat for us to, to hold. When when you lose an MP in who uh, you know who has disgraced themselves and was essentially thrown out by Parliament and then recalled by his constituents, you're highly, I think, you're highly unlikely to be. Um, rewarded by uh, the electorate, and electorates do not like by-elections uh, being uh, uh, put on them uh, because of a, a failing uh, like that. And so, um, yeah, I, I got to say, from the very start, I would have expected to lose back for South. But we had a, uh, we've got a really good candidate there in, da in David Jones, and he's worked his socks off in that seat to demonstrate um, what a good Conservative MP can achieve. But in terms of tonight, are you ready to acknowledge what you're hearing? I know all of your phones will be buzzing through the night that actually it's pretty much Yeah, gone. your floor manager told us to turn them off, but we're not going to do that, <laughs> are we? So um, <laughs> it was a good attempt, I've got to say. Um, uh, I think there's real life and then there's politics, yeah, 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 yeah. right? So, um, I, I, so I actually haven't had many indications other than the ones you've had as, as well, and so I'm hearing exactly the same You're thing. hearing the same thing. Um, Bridget Phillipson, then you're letting out an early smile. We're hopeful about Blackpool South. You know, we fought a really strong campaign there. It was clear, knocking on doors, and I've been up there like lots of people, that there was a real mood and appetite for change. I think some of the frustration, however, that voters have is that they're not getting a general election on the same day um, because there is a mood right across the country that people really want the chance to have their say in terms of who gets to govern 
the country as well as these important elections that we're talking about this evening. And in the terms, though, of the ch size of the change, um, can you give us any indication? Because in by-elections in recent months, Labour has been getting swings, huge swings, you know, of over 20% in recent by-elections. Is that the kind of level you'll be expecting or hoping for? Well, those were amongst the biggest swings we've ever had mm. uh, in England, so it would be quite something. No, we're not, we're not in that kind of... Uh, I don't You're think not... we'd be in that kind of ballpark. We don't need to be either, because the swings that we had in... Some of those by-elections earlier this year have been amongst the biggest in the post-war period. So they were, really were quite extraordinary results in very traditional Conservative seats. Now, Blackpool South, for all, it was Labour held until 2019 when we lost it. It has, for the majority of the time it has existed as a seat, had a Conservative MP. So if we're making progress there, if we're taking Blackpool South tonight, and I really hope that we do, that puts us on a really firm footing going into uh, the general really election. To compare the 1920s with the 2020s, I think, well. just in politics. <laughs> yes, but she makes the point there. I mean, and I should say to you, Bridget, that, that seat was held, I think, from 97 all the way through to 19. So it was a Labour seat for a very long time. And if the national opinion polls are correct and you are miles ahead, as they suggest, then that seat should be a no-brainer. But for the rest of the time before that, it had been a Conservative seat. So, and then we lost it in 2019. So, you know, I'm hopeful that we're making progress in the areas like Blackpool, but also across the country as the results come in this evening, in the kinds of places we will need to win in order to form the majority. And that's what I'll be looking for. Less about the numbers of seats, more about the places where we're making progress. Although sometimes when politicians say less about the numbers, what they're really saying is we're not that sure about making really hefty gains. Um, but, Manira, for the Lib Dems, yeah. what's a good night for you? So this time last year, we were all sitting in the studio and the Lib Dems had a really successful time. This year, what do you think the prospects are? Yeah, we made spectacular gains mm. this time last year, but we've also got to remember there's three times fewer seats up for election this year. Uh, and actually, the, the, the sort of mix of seats that are up for election this year are really in those red wall territories. They are largely Conservative Labour fights, and we're expecting to see Labour make great gains. We are hoping to consolidate and actually make gains in the blue wall, the areas that we're targeting for the general election later this year. A lot of those won't be coming in until tomorrow. You think about Dominic Raab's backyard in Easter and Walton, El Elmbridge, Surrey, yeah. Elmbridge um, and John Redwood's backyard in Wokingham, places like Tunbridge Wells, <clears throat> which we uh, hope to make gains in and potentially take control of. All of those will be coming in tomorrow and we'll be looking very, very closely at those because we'll be very keen to make gains uh, in those areas where we hope to take uh, Conservative seats at the general election But next do you year, have a sense uh, yet tonight? I mean, I know I'm sure you were all on the doors today. You'll all have been talking to colleagues and activists mm -hmm. in the last few days. Do you have a sense yet that you're able to make a big stride forward in the way that you did last year? Because we're, you know, maybe only a couple of months from a general election. Surely you have to be showing that you can punch through. Yeah, we, we certainly do hope to make gains in those areas that we're looking to gain at the general election. At this stage, it's far too early to, to give you an indication, Laura, because most of those areas aren't counting until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of those sort of Labour-dominated areas that are counting overnight. Sure. Well, you've all said it, and it is true that we are very, very early in the night, but where better to hear than from on the ground? We're going to take you to two different counts. First of all, to Harlow, and my colleague Simon Dedman is there for us tonight. Simon, thanks so much for joining us. Now, Harlow's really the kind of place where Labour needs to be showing progress, isn't it? Tell us what's been going on there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this place has been a classic bellwether, Laura, for 40 years. Whoever's won this seat at Westminster has gone on to take the keys to 10 Downing Street. And at the moment, the mood here between the Conservatives and Labour is that it is looking pretty close. The uh, vote verification is still underway. Quite a few wards looking particularly very tight. And both parties saying that one of the key places to watch is going to be this area called Latin Bush, where Labour needs to t retake uh, those seats if they're going to be within a chance of retaking this council, which the Conservatives won a majority in 2021 when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister and, and living the vaccine dream as it was for the party in those sets of local elections. And since then, the Conservatives have been able to hold on here in Harlow. But now Labour really feels that it's their chance. And Keir Starmer even said that he sees Harlow as one of his real targets in Essex. And what's been the chat among voters, you know, as you've been out and about talking to people, what issues have been coming up 
Has it been about the national picture? Or as often in these elections, there's sometimes a local issue that's really been driving people around the twist, and that's what shift votes. You cannot get away from the national political scene on the ground here, but actually housing is a massive issue locally. The lack of social housing, people struggling to get on the housing ladder, leaving Harlow, moving further northwards because they can't afford a home here. That's a big issue, as is regeneration. There are quite a lot of people, I found, who haven't made up their minds who to vote for in the past few weeks. I mean, a lot of people who are going to be turning out uh, here are making up their minds quite late in the day. We haven't got a turnout figure yet. It has traditionally been quite low here in the local elections. Last year, it was just 25% of voters who turned out on the, on the day. OK, Simon, thanks so much. We'll be back with you later on. It's interesting to note that's one of those places where there's a well-known Conservative MP standing down. Rob Halfon is a government minister and well-known MP for many years. He's one of the many incumbents, to use the jargon, who's saying goodbye at the general election. And that may well have a big effect whenever we get to that poll. Let's go north to Oldham and speak to Shelley Phelps. Now, Shelley, that's part of the world where Labour's got quite a specific worry about how some voters might have been reacting, haven't, hasn't it? Hi, Laura. That's right. So they're just verifying the votes at the moment behind me. Counting hasn't actually started yet, so we're not going to have any results in for a while. But as you say, this is an interesting one because Labour has a majority here of just one, and they're in a pretty precarious uh, position. Now, recently, two uh, councillors quit the party over its stance on Gaza, including one who is standing as an independent. And actually, for the Conservatives as well, uh, three of their councillors, they suspended them when they attended a pro-Palestinian uh, march on Armistice day and so we are looking here to see what the effect of the Israel Gaza war might be on Labour's chances of uh, success. This is a very diverse area according to the most recent consensus just under a quarter of people identified as Muslim and speaking to um, Labour campaigners people that are, uh, have arrived here already they are nervous, they tell me. The mood is one of concern about whether they are going to lose control of the council. In terms of the Westminster picture, you've got three uh, Labour MPs covering here. A little bit of the borough falls into the Labour deputy leader, Angela Rayner's constituency. She's been campaigning here in recent days. And just a moment ago, as Rita was uh, referring to, just recently, next door in neighbouring Rochdale, we had George Galloway's win here for his Workers' Party of Britain, that big shock buyer election win and of course he has pledged that one of the things his party wants to do is to oust Angela Rayner. And the other question around Angela Rayner that has been hard for her to escape about her own personal affairs and tax cuts some years ago, is that something that you've heard come up at all? Yeah, that's interesting, actually. It's, and it's not something that anyone has mentioned to me. I think speaking to Labour campaigners, the, the predominant issue that they seem to be worried about is um, some of their voters who are perhaps angry at the party over their stance on Gaza, that they didn't call for a ceasefire uh, quickly enough all that they're more focused at, you know, the other sort of uh, campaign themes and issues that you're picking up on is around local issues, you know, as you would expect, bins, potholes, housing, rents, but also speaking to some voters today, you're right that the national stuff does play into this because people were talking to me about the, the national picture and there was that sense among some people, you know, the, the apathy that they just feel that nobody is kind of on their side or going to make a difference. Shelley, thanks so much and give us a nudge when we start to get results through from there. Thank you very much to you for now in Oldham. Let's go then to Hartlepool. Now, as we were talking to Chris about a while ago, that's a really vital place for Labour to show that they can grab votes back. Huge Conservative success there in 2021. We can talk to Dave McMillan, who's there for us tonight. Um, Labour got smiles on their faces or are they looking nervous? No, I think Labour are fairly confident that they will be making uh, a return to power here in Hartlepool in the Council at the very least. As has already been alluded to, the last few years have been miserable for Labour here. It was a Labour stronghold for many, many years, but they lost that by-election in 2021. Chris Mason mentioned the giant inflatable Boris Johnson that was doing the rounds, almost taunting the Labour Party at that time. A couple of years before they'd even lost control of the Council before a vote had been cast due to infighting within the party. But they are on the way back. Last year, they got within a couple 
couple of votes of taking the council and the electoral maths is very much in their favour this year. Another thing that's interesting in Hartlepool is reform. It's actually a blast of happy birthday for somebody going on behind me. Um, another thing that's interesting in Hartlepool, though, apart from the birthday wishes, is that reformers stand in all 12 wards. It's a very important target for them. Richard Tice has got a huge office in the town, so it'll be interesting to see how they go on. For the Conservatives, clearly they would dearly like to hold on to the leadership of Hartlepool Council, which they currently share with independents. But the real test for them will come tomorrow with the Tees Valley mayoral election. They, of course, will be desperate to see Ben Houchin hold on there. And in terms of that Ben Houchin race, I mean, there's an interesting thing that's gone on there. We've had in the last couple of days a lot of Conservative spin about how it would be a huge victory for them to be able to hold on to him. They seem to be quite confident that they'll be able to do that, although, as you say, we won't get that result for a couple of days, in fact. But just talk to us about the context there. I mean, when he was chosen first time round, he had almost a sort of North Korean scale of the vote. Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, last time it was something like 73% uh, percent of the vote that Ben Houchin had. I think it, at one point it was described as a, the single greatest personal mandate that anyone had ever had uh, in a British election. So he's a hugely important figure for the Conservatives, and he has uh, had a huge impact on the local political landscape. The vibe seems to be that uh, he probably will hang on to the election. There was a poll out a couple of weeks ago that had Labour's Chris McEwen and the Conservative Ben Houchin neck and neck. Another poll came out this week which suggested that Ben Houchin had pulled seven points ahead. And it certainly seems that most of the, the vibe is that he will hold on, and it will be a hugely significant uh, thing for the Conservatives if he does, because he's a hugely influential figure in the party, and, of course, he was influential in them breaking through the Red Wall before Boris Johnson in 2019. Ben Houchin, of course, has done it already in 2017. Dave, thank you very much indeed for now, and Hartlepool will be back with you a bit later in the night as we get a sense of what is happening there in the northeast of England. Right, let's stand back a bit look at the big picture because these results as they come in will of course be vital to preparing a picture of the run-up to the general election but they also take place in of course a historical context of the extraordinary political events that we have been through that we've all lived through in the last few years and Rita you've got that context there and you can explain how these local results mirror it really. Absolutely Laura and what I've got here as you can see is results going back 20 years and these are the share of support of each of the main parties based on the results of the local elections and by that I mean we are able to extrapolate from local election results which don't happen all over the country but we can work out using data from key wards where we track patterns over time we can work out how the whole country would have voted if everyone had been voting so let me take you right the way back to the beginning and you can see that during the Labour years under Blair and Brown it's the blue line that's in the ascendancy it's the Conservatives because well people do it is, it is one of those things that people do tend to want to give the government a kicking during midterm. You can see there's a change uh, once David Cameron's in power and it's the red line that starts to dominate. Not everywhere. There are blips in certain places. Here in 2015, it was the Conservatives who did better. 2017 under Theresa May, remember she had a fantastic night which then uh, caused her to call a general election where she promptly lost her majority. Uh, then you can see, again, Conservatives doing very well in 2021, but then they've been on the slide since then. So in 2023, the share of the vote for the main parties was, as you can see, Labour on 35%. Conservatives on 26%, the Lib Dems on 20 and others on 19 And by the end of this evening or sometime during the course of the night, we should be able to track that uh, line to see what will ha be happening in 2024. So based on about a third of the results overnight, overall, we should be able to see how that uh, share of the vote will be changing uh, as if the whole country had been voting. So do stay with us. Rita, thank you very much indeed. So local elections are not the same as the national elections, but you've just so shown us how they are a really important kind of tracker of where things are going. Absolutely. I just also want to explain to the eagle-eyed among you, you might have noticed there is a prime minister missing in that enormous chart. You can see we go Cameron, May, Johnson, Sunak. Now, you will all know that Liz Truss was in charge for some time. However, we are not poking fun at how short her time in office was. 
There were no local elections contested during her time in Absolutely. Downing Street. That's the reason she's not on That's your chart, isn't it, Rita? Absolutely, exactly. Okay. We All haven't right. forgotten. <laughs> there is a reason. OK, well, I think a lot of people who are wondering about voting Conservative maybe haven't forgotten either about Liz Truss. And Chris Eaton harris you know, you are. We've seen from how the change of, of votes shares have changed and your polling position for a long time now. You are in quite a predicament, aren't you? Well, that makes the mayoral election in Teesside even more interesting, doesn't it? Because supposedly we've been... Uh, we are massively behind in the polls. We were behind in the early polls in Teesside and, and now supposedly we're in place. So in, even in the course of an election campaign where Labour have thrown the kitchen sink at it, I don't know how many times Keir Starmer's been up to Teesside, six, seven, eight. Um, uh, you know, uh, Ben Houchen, who is an amazingly good mayor, um, who has delivered for the people of Teesside on all, all sorts of... has had all sorts of personal attacks, political attacks, and a huge uh, Labour campaign. And it would be, I'd say, uh, if we're on these, these sorts of numbers that you're mm -hmm. suggesting, it would be a, quite a surprise for us to do well in Teesside. Well, he, he, he got more than 70% of the vote last time. But hold that thought for a second, because I want to bring you... I think we can show you our first couple of results coming in, perhaps from Sunderland, but maybe they're not quite ready. Bridget, that's your part of the world. You'll have to hurry them up, because we were hoping to bring you them just in the last couple of minutes, in the next couple of minutes. But, Chris Heaton harris you say it would be amazing if you managed to hold on to Ben Houchen, but he did get more than 70% of the vote last time. And he himself said during the campaign, there are lots of people who speak to me and say they'll vote for me, but they probably won't vote Conservative at the general election. If he holds on, it's despite your national party, not because of it, no, isn't it? No, it would be because, and with the national party, um, he's standing as a Conservative mayor. I'm pretty sure had he stood... Uh, for uh, any other party or indeed as an independent, he would not do as well. Um, we, and we've had loads of MPs campaigning for Ben. And um, I'm really, you know, he's, he's a really good mayor. He deserves to be elected on, on, on his own right because he's delivered massively for the people of Teesside. But uh, this, I think, leads into the point that where you actually do promise things and then deliver them, that you have the opportunity then to talk to voters about uh, persuading them to vote for you. And that's, that's even, what he's done. Even though he's been spelling out to voters that, you know, people are, are going to back him, but they're not going to vote for the rest uh, of you. Uh, he will... Uh, there, in 2019, that was the first time we had some of these seats in Teesside. In 20, before 2019, uh, every seat within that Teesside morality was Labour. Um, this is... That's quite something. That's OK, well, let's not get one. bogged down also in a contest that we're not going to get the result from until tomorrow afternoon. Um, let's talk to you, Bridget Phillipson. I mean, maybe Chris Heaton harris has a point. Actually, if Labour's poll lead is real and credible, you really ought to be sweeping the board everywhere. So I'll, I'll deal specifically with Tees Valley and then move on to kind of the wider dynamics of the evening. I mean, Ben Houchen has run a mile from the Conservative branding during this contest. And as we've been discussing, secured an enormous uh, share of the vote uh, back in 2021. It would require a 23% swing for us to take that. I mean, that is huge. I am confident we will make progress, um, but I heard a lot of people on the doors and side saying exactly what Ben Houchen has been saying. And I'm confident that we will make progress come the general election on side. We've just seen there in Hartlepool, again, an area where we've made real progress last time around, and I'm confident we'll make progress again this evening. And I think that does demonstrate the scale of the change that we've seen under Keir Starmer from where we were back in 2021, uh, losing that by-election, you know, enormous challenge. And we do have the Blackpool South by-election this evening, which is the most obvious comparator where it comes to parliamentary results. And the mayoral contests are a different kind of dynamic for a range of reasons, and I would apply that across the country. But I'm sure if you do well in them, you'll be very quick to hail them as some, you know, enormous victory. Um, just to say to you, we're just hearing that Blackpool South might come actually sooner than we think. I just had a uh, um, communication from some, somebody suggesting that they might actually be nearly finished the counting, so we'll, we'll keep an eye. That seems very early in the night, but I just wanted to flag that for you there in case we suddenly have to jump away. Um, but Bridget Phillipson, I'm just listening to you you know, you're using a lot of political phrases like showing considerable progress and showing that we've made an advance. Yeah. Will you give us an idea of what would be a reasonable benchmark? So some of the number crunching is suggesting gaining around 300 would be decent for Labour, given the pattern of where the seats are coming up. It's the areas and not the numbers. So it's making progress in the kind of key places that we need to demonstrate we're making advances for the general election. So where that aligns 
with our parliamentary seats that we will need in order to secure that majority. And, you know, what I've heard right across the country, and I've travelled the kind of the length and breadth of England uh, in recent weeks and months, is that there is a real mood and appetite for change. I've spoken to so many lifelong Conservative voters who've just had enough. They're not prepared to vote Conservative. They're sick of the chaos. The, the very fact that we're having the Blackpool South by-election this evening, I think, demonstrates just the chaos, the sleaze, and, you know, people just want to turn a corner and they want you know, Britain to have a better future ahead of us. OK, well, we can now show you our first set of results so we can start filling in the blanks of some of our political conversations. Here are some of the early results from Sunderland. They haven't finished counting, but there are enough results to say that Labour will hold the council. Now, that's not a surprise in and of itself. They've held, they've got 39 seats, the Lib Dems on eight, the Tories back on seven. Let's look at the change of seats well, it looks like no seats have changed hands. But the share, there it is, 54% to Labour, only 5% for the Lib Dems, 9% for the Conservatives. And look there in the turquoise, REF, that's the Reform Party. Now, if you're a politico, you'll know the Reform Party is what emerged out of the remains of the Brexit Party. And they are working very hard to try to make a dent. They're not standing everywhere. They are standing in that by-election, but they're not standing everywhere in the country. But look at this change in the share. Now, Labour up by 5%, so that is distinct, but not overwhelming. The Tories down by 16% in Sunderland. Independents down by 11%, but look at that again. The Reform Party there in Turquoise up by 19%. So Reform gaining more in share than the Conservatives are losing. Interesting, isn't it? But only four wards in. So we've got the result, but we don't have the breakdown of every single seat that's happened there in Sunderland. So to help us decode that at this early part of the night, let's bring in Professor Sir John Curtis. John, looking at these first straws in the political wind tonight, what, makes, what does that make you think? Well, Sunderland, of course, in parliamentary elections is often early. And we do have to remember that Sunderland does have its own particular characteristics. Above all, this is a very Eurosceptic part of the country. It's also somewhere where UKIP did well in local elections in the past. And we've now seen reform outpoll the Conservatives in each of the ward results that we've got in from Sunderland so far. And as you've just seen in the summary, uh, the Conservative vote is uh, well, well down on 2021. Indeed, it's even down on this time last year. So at least in this early result, we should bear, and that the Conservatives do have reason to be concerned about what's going to happen in Eurosceptic parts of the country where reform do stand. And Sunderland was exceptional. It's one of the very few places where reform are fighting all the wards. But still, early signs at least suggest, as we've been anticipating, it's going to be a difficult night for the Conservatives. One of the stories I think we're going to be tracking is to what extent do they particularly suffer where reform are standing? Labour making progress, but modest progress. But after all, Sunderland is already very strongly Labour, so perhaps we shouldn't expect too much in the way of further progress from Labour here. And John, if the national polls are essentially giving us a true picture, what kind of increases should we be seeing from the Labour Party tonight? Give us some context on that. Well, the trouble is the Labour Party doesn't tend to do as well in local elections as it does in the opinion polls at any particular point in time. It's partly because the Liberal Democrats uh, do better. But I think given that the Labour Party is at least where it was 12 months ago, uh, given that last year's local election performance was somewhat modest by the standards of what we might have expected, I think Labour would like at least to be a point or two up on where they were last year. But that, you know, frankly translates into you know, something like a 10-point increase on where they were back in 2021. Um, so those are the kind of figures that you should be looking out for. But I think, uh, uh, to be honest, I think now, given how much the conservative decline in Sunderland seems to be tied to the presence and the strength of reform, the $64,000 question now is what's going to happen in the majority of wards where reform are not present? Are the results in Sunderland going to be exceptionally bad for the Conservatives? Um, or, uh, because elsewhere, where the reform aren't standing, some of the voters they've lost are going to vote for them anyway when they find reform on the ballot paper. Or will voters 
still stay away from putting an X on the conservative, against the Conservative candidate, even if reform were not present? That's one of the questions, a potentially vital question, to which we don't as yet know the answer. OK, John, stick with us. We'll be back with you a bit later. I can show you some pictures of the count getting going there in Exeter. And let's also show you the picture in Rushmore in Hampshire, where Labour is very hopeful of making progress, potentially even making a gain. Hampshire, uh, Rushmore is the council where the town of Aldershot is, so that's a very military area. So that would be interesting if Labour manages to make progress there. Let's show you again the count counters getting busy in Hartlepool. We've talked already about why Hartlepool is so vital and interesting. Interesting history of that seat there. Big scene of Tory victory in 2021. And then let's show you again what's going on in Blackpool South. Now, there are there some people standing around. Oh, I'm trying to have a, have a closer look and see if there's any, uh, any decisive action. But it looks like some of the tables are empty. So maybe the counting is progressing faster than we had expected. Um, let's also talk to one of the Conservatives who will be watching this all very closely as it comes in. Henry Hill, who is the deputy editor of the big popular Conservative website, Conservative Home. Thank you indeed for joining us this evening. I think you're the acting editor, actually, Henry. I'm terribly sorry I demoted you. I didn't mean to do that. Now, we heard there Chris Heaton Harris try to emphasise that there might be success for the Conservatives hanging on to the Teesside mayoralty. We won't get that results, Phil, tomorrow afternoon. But from what your contacts have been saying to you in the last few days, from what you have been hearing so far, how do you expect this election 48 hours to pan out for your party? So I think the, the crucial thing in the short term will be the mayoral elections because those I think have a disproportionate ability to sway the narrative that comes out of this about the Prime Minister and the party's fortunes. If they hold on to Tees Valley that's at least not a complete wipeout. If they manage to hold on to the West Midlands which is a, a longer shot then that would be a real shot in the arm and that I think will be more maybe than the councillors what's going to determine how panicky MPs are come Monday morning once the ashes are settled and we know where we stand. But I think in the terms of the general election, the more important thing will probably be the councillors because councillors, you're much more likely to see voting on national brand than you are with mayors where you have people with a much stronger individual mandate and their individual brand because they're standing as a single person. And also because councillors are the infantry of a general election campaign. And one of the concerns that I've heard from Conservatives and one reason that some people really were agitating for the Prime Minister to go for an election this month is that if the Conservatives suffer heavy council losses, that's hundreds of people who probably many of them won't be out campaigning for the party in an autumn election, nor will their friends and family who might normally campaign for them. So it will be interesting to see at the end of the weekend how much damage has been done to the Conservatives' ground machine. And in terms of last year's performance, I mean, it was woeful for the Conservatives at the local council elections last year. They lost a 1,000. Um, and it's interesting you're saying there, if they make big losses this year again, actually, that's what MPs should be paying attention to. Has sort of Tory HQ already managed to spin them into worrying about the wrong things? Well, it's, it's partly the media's fault, right? Um, the, the mayoral elections do have a very high profile and there will be a natural... They will naturally be very interesting if Andy Street especially manages to hold on uh, in the West Midlands, an area which I think we would normally say leans Labour. That will be a very interesting result. But yes, I think in terms of if you're a Conservative MP, you will have, if you're a good campaigner, you will have a personal vote and you will have a local profile. But you will be also, most of your voters will be people who turn out and tick the box by the party they want to vote for. And in that case, the local elections will, I think, be a much stronger tell of a party's performance in a given area than a good performance by a Conservative mayor. Henry Hill, thank you so much indeed for now. Um, Chris, I just want to ask you about mm. this point. So it's true that the narrative, to use the jargon, has become very dominated by the mayoral mm. contest. And actually, not just by any old mayoral contest, by two specifically, when there are 11 going on around the country. Um, do you think that MPs are then sort of looking at the wrong things? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, isn't it here? And I think you get a, a clash between the sort of sophology, the numbers that John Curtis and others will crunch, and what that might mean extrapolating to a general election, and then the psychology. And as Henry was saying, 
baked into the whole idea, the case that is made for the mayoral model is the idea that you have these high-profile regional figures who are then quasi-national figures because they can be a, a sort of ambassadorial figure on the national stage for their region. It also means, though, that they can develop a political brand that is a far greater extension of their party brand than is perhaps possible if you're a council leader or an MP, which means you can make your campaigning points a little detached from your party. And we've absolutely seen the likes of Andy Street, the Conservative mayor, Conservative candidate, as things stand for the uh, West Midlands uh, mayoralty, uh, do just that, to wear his conservatism very, very lightly. He's always done that in this role. He has particularly done it in the context of this race. That said, on the ballot paper, we should be clear, as Chris was saying a few minutes ago, still says Conservative next to his name. But in terms of the psychology for Conservative MPs, mm. There is no doubt they are attaching, attaching quite a lot of significance to those two contests in the Tees Valley and the uh, West Midlands as a way, if they are able to hold them, to say, well, things might be bad if that's how it turns out in the council elections and other contests for them, but perhaps not as bad as it could have been. So there's a lot of psychology as well as spin around those races in particular. And in a second, we're going to talk to our colleague James Pearson, who's in Redditch, which is in the Midlands, but just outside the West mm. Midlands mayoralty area. We'll check in with him in just a sec. But is it actually the case, though, that the mayoralty is actually... They're an anomaly because of exactly as you've been explaining, they're separate to the sort of normal run of things. Yeah, they are, really. And they're a relatively novel and new concept, mm. aren't they? In fact, in this set of elections, there are parts of England that are electing a mayor for the very first time in the East Midlands, in York and North Yorkshire, and in large parts of the northeast of England, north of the, uh, the Tees Valley area. So they are, in numerical and cephalogical terms, as John Curtis will tell us throughout mm. the night, different and something of an anomaly. But in the mood-making they will be significant, without question. OK, well, let's take you to Redditch then in the West Midlands. Um, it's not in the mayor's area, Andy Street, where there's that closely fought contest, but it is in that place where there are lots and lots of seats that will be marginal at the general election. And Redditch is a council that is a Labour target. They last won it in 2016. And, James, it's a straight battle between Labour and the Tories, isn't it? What are you hearing? Yeah, that's what it's shaping up. That's what it looks like tonight. The nerves are definitely building here at the uh, Abbey Stadium. The political parties, Labour, Conservatives, they are used to fighting council elections three years out of four. They are used to going out on the doorsteps. They're used to the issues coming up. But this year it's the big one because it's all out elections, all the council seats up here. And that's what I think is fueling the nerves. Labour, as you say, should be confident of taking this. That's what they've been telling me when I've been going out on the doorsteps with them in recent weeks. Tonight, though, they seem a bit nervy. We've got three candidates award, three councillors award being elected here, and they potentially think that voters are splitting their votes between some of the parties. They might not scoop up all the three councillors they could get per ward. The Conservatives, they have been out trying really hard today, as has the local MP and Deputy Chair of the Conservative Party, Rachel McLean. So we'll see. They think it's too close to call at the moment. The Greens, they're hopeful of maybe taking a seat or two, but it really is a battle between Labour and the Conservatives. And you mentioned the kind of majorities and marginals in general elections. Rachel McLean holds this seat for the Conservatives with a majority of 16,000 at the moment. But if Labour take this seat tonight, they will be confident they can take it in a general election in months, potentially. OK, James, thank you so much. We'll be back with you later in the night. An interesting battle there and a straight fight between Tories and the Labour Party. Um, we've got a bit more information coming in from Sunderland in terms of how things panned out with the arithmetic. You can see Labour now 41 seats, Tories with eight, same as the Lib Dems. But then in terms of seats changing hands, you can see a straight switch there, Labour gaining one, the Tories dropping one. Let's show you more about how the share of the vote has changed. And this is the really interesting thing there. You can see the Tories dropping by 17%. The Reform Party going up by exactly the same amount. So a straight switch there between the Tories and the Reform Party. Sunderland was a very strong sort of leavey part of the world, very strong support for the Brexit referendum, where those iconic images of the beginning of the night were from back in 2016. But very interesting to see that straight switch. And you can see why the leader of the Reform Party, Richard Tice, has tweeted this. Outstanding early results in Sunderland. We expect to beat the Tories in a majority of 25 seats in Sunderland. 
Well, Richard Tice, we will see. We'll hope to speak to him later on in the evening. But so far, Reform are hailing their own progress in Sunderland, where they claim they will beat the Tories in 25 seats, although they haven't won a seat there yet. But in terms of that vote share, they have put on a lot, taking away from the Tories, it seems. There are some more pictures in Blackpool South, and there are definitely people now who look like they've finished their duties for the evening. We were expecting the result there, not for quite some time, but it does look as if things have progressed quite quickly. Um, Chris, in terms of that switch from Tories to reform mm. directly in Sunderland, that is the kind of thing that's going to make Conservatives really nervy, isn't it? Yeah, and so little wonder that Richard Tice was leaping onto social media within nanoseconds, even at this very early stage of seeing results from there. Of course, we can't be certain exactly where votes have come from that might have gone in reform's direction, but there's a certain symmetry there that will alarm Conservatives. Yes, there's the particular political history, if you like, of, of, of Sunderland, which people will recall from the uh, early results of the uh, Brexit uh, referendum. But in terms of that dynamic that exists in British politics at the moment, involving the Conservatives and Reform, with Reform UK absolutely insistent that they are not going to call off the dogs, that they mm. will, that they regard the Conservatives as a, as a spent force and want to inflict damage, Richard Tice and others will point to this result and indeed others if this represents something of a, a trend as the results come, uh, to say that they are going to be very influential in causing mm. the Conservatives harm. And they can do it, as we've seen in Sunderland, and they hope reform come the general election, without themselves actually winning anywhere. If they can peel away a sufficient number of previous Conservative voters that might in some places be the difference mm. between the Conservative and the Labour vote. It will be interesting through the night as well to see how well or not reform do in Blackpool South in the parliamentary by-election. That's right. We were hearing from Helen on the ground there that they didn't seem to be expecting to come into second place. No. But if they did come in second place or got very close to the Conservatives, that really would spook them. I mean, Chris Heaton-Harris, how concerned are you about the threat from reform? Well, firstly, it's definitely not a direct switch. And, um, uh, and I think you might have noticed that, uh, on those figures when they flash up, I think there was an indep independence down 8% and... Um, this is Bridget's seat, so I'm not going to try and uh, tell Bridget that, you know, in Red Hill there was quite a young, strong UKIP presence in the past. Um, and so, and it's, and it's a very um, uh, interesting place to, uh, to do politics, I'm absolutely sure. But the one thing it does show you uh, is that if you, vote re if you vote reform, you get Labour. And if so, um, it's a very straightforward equation for people at the next general election. If they want to vote reform, they'll end up with uh, Labour MPs and they'll end up with the Labour government and then they'll end up probably with everything that they didn't want to vote for based on the profile of reform voters. But what it actually shows us at the moment is that as things stand right now in May 2024, people are choosing the Reform Party instead of the Conservatives. And you're right, we've got no way of getting inside voters' minds and seeing if it was a direct switch, but their share increased as much as yours fell away. And people, by those statistics, early in the night, are walking away from you and choosing them instead. No, uh, I, so I think it's a way more complicated picture than that even in Sunderland, but I'm not going to prey on Bridget's seat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and... Uh, but the direct lesson of this um, already, I think, you, the one thing you can draw is that, as, and that this particular seat that has swapped hands is that reform polled um, a, a decent chunk of the vote that made it a Labour gain. But that is because voters are choosing them, not you. In Sunderland, so far, you yeah, are I, I, down so, six points since but, last year. But, the, but at the general election, this is a very clear choice that people will be making. Here, they're uh, electing very good councillors, I'm absolutely sure, across all the political parties, uh, people who want to do well in, in their communities. At the general election, you are choosing the government of the country, you're choosing uh, your immigration policy, your taxation policy, you're, talking, you're choosing your education policy. Um, and uh, these are big choices, and a vote for reform equals a vote for Labour. Well, so, Bridget Phillipson, what do you say to that? You are the Sunderland expert around this table, so perhaps you can <laughs> give us a perspective. Well, I'd happily talk about Sunderland all night, but I'm not sure your viewers would be... Uh necessarily that fascinated in the micro detail of Sunderland politics. I'm uh, sure we've got lots of viewers in Sunderland and I don't want anybody to be offended by that. We can talk about well, Sunderland I'll, plenty. I'd, but... <laughs> I'd talk about it all night, but I'll keep my remarks a bit more broad, uh, broad brush. You know, we've, you know, it's a, it is Sunderland as a council that we already control. 
And whilst the results are encouraging and we've, you know, we've, we've taken a seat from the Conservatives, which is fantastic news, we haven't seen the full sweep of the results either. I think it again goes back to the point about looking across the country as the results come in, especially for us in those areas where we need to make progress in order to form a parliamentary majority. And those are the kinds of places, you know, we, we were talking about Hartlepool, Redditch, we just heard from the count there as well. I was there just last week and what was absolutely clear was that lifelong Conservative voters are turning away from the Conservative Party and they're coming directly over to Labour because they've just had enough of all of this chaos. Um, you know, everything that began with Boris Johnson then drifting on into Liz Truss and then here we are now. And there is a real mood and appetite for change. But, but you've just said they're coming directly to Labour. Actually, yeah. in your home city, we've just seen that actually swathes of them are going to reform. Well, what you will often see, of course, you will see different kinds of results in areas that is already... Um, where you already have a majority for one party. So rarely would the result in Sunderland, be it at a general election or a local election, necessarily have the same carryover that you would expect in other parts of the country. But certainly where I've been campaigning, whether it's in the East Midlands, uh, in the West Midlands and in places like Teesside, we are getting direct Tory, lifelong Tory voters directly switching to Labour. But then you mentioned their Teesside and the West Midlands and you've already said... Oh, well, actually, the mayoralties, they're sort of a bit of an anomaly. They're, they're yeah. not really... They're very always going to be very hard for us. But you've yeah. just said yourself, you've been there. Loads of Labour politicians have been to both. You have campaigned very, very hard in those places. And from the kind of language you're giving us tonight, it sounds like you really don't think you're going to make it. Well, of course, we fought really hard in all of the mayoralties uh, across the country, especially in those target areas such as East Midlands, West Midlands uh, and Teesside. But, you know, you were talking just earlier about the fact that these are different kinds of contests. I'm confident that we will make progress in Teesside, but the scale of the swing that would be required in order to take that mayoralty would be enormous, which is why the Conservatives want to focus in on that. But what about are, the West Midlands? It's a, t it's a tough contest and, you know, I think a lot will end up coming down to turnout. But these are different kinds of contests. And in the case of both, both the West Midlands and Tees Valley, the Tory incumbents have absolutely run a mile from the Tory brand because they know how damaging it is to their prospects of re-election. Chris, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Rishi sent out an email to every uh, every Conservative voter pledge um, in uh, in the West Midlands yesterday uh, uh, supporting Andy Street. Uh, and I've got to say, I've been on a few doors myself. And whilst, I mean, I, mean, I think Apathy might win this particular set of elections because local elections have quite a low turnout well, compared well, to Well, your old friend Boris Johnson also sent out a message he saying, forget Westminster, vote for Ben. Yeah, so, but, but, you know. but, that, that, but Boris is campaigning for fellow Conservatives. And actually, just going back to a point that Chris made, um, uh, mayoral candidates do reflect, uh, do have a direct reflection on how your party does. And I, I pray in aid of Boris Johnson when he won the mayoralty of London um, under David Cameron's premiership. They are different, though, aren't they? Because the very nature of the model is one that emphasises the individual. Yeah, so you can saying, stand saying, above, yeah. you can stand a little bit above. Of course, you carry a party mm. label, but you can stand above to a greater degree than plenty of other politicians mm. can. I, th I think uh, Keir Starmer, the Labour Party, um, the wider media would agree that Ben Houchin is a Conservative candidate and everybody knows in, T in Tees Valley that he's the Conservative candidate. Bridget, he's, he's not been particularly keen to emphasise uh, that fact, I think it's fair to say, during the course of that contest. Bridget, given the mountain that Labour has to climb to win the general election, shouldn't you be winning the mayoral race in the West Midlands and indeed in, Tees, in Tees Valley? It's not long ago that the Tees, Teesside, the Tees Valley was a, a Labour stronghold by a million miles. Well, as we've been talking about earlier, you know, we had the Hartlepool by-election that we lost, whereas last year in the local elections there in Hartlepool, we, we did make progress. I'm confident we'll make further progress again this evening. And it is clear to me, campaigning right across Teesside, that we are making progress in those key marginal seats for the general election. But the scale of the swing required in order to take that, it's 23%. I mean, that is a really, really big swing that would be required. And actually winning those parliamentary seats wouldn't require that level of swing. But, you know... The Conservatives, of course, are very keen to talk about Tees Valley in order to distract from the wider picture that we are likely to see across the country this evening, mm -hmm. which is Labour making significant progress in areas of the country, in the north, in the south, across but, but, the, across the, the, the Midlands, though, Bridget, in course, order to it, win parliamentary the, 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 constituencies. The, the truth, though, of course, is that you would also absolutely dearly love to be showing progress and taking mayoral races and winning... I want to win everywhere. Of course oh, well, I do. Well, well, absolutely. Of course I want to win everywhere. And, 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 that's what politics but, is all about. Maria, I just wonder, as you're listening to, the, to those two, um, and mayoralties are one thing, mm -hmm. and actually... 
those results are not going to come until Friday yeah. and then Saturday afternoon is when we're going to have to wait for Andy Street. But are you confident, though, that the Lib Dems, you know, you, you used to have this reputation as being a challenger party, being able to rush in when the others were in big trouble. Do you think you're actually able to show that pattern tonight? Yeah, we've just made our first gain as well on ah, the night. news. Where is yes. that then? Uh, our so system's not in, telling us yet. So. It's in <laughs> Leicestershire, where there's been a county council by-election. We've won a seat from the Tories with a 14% swing in the new parliamentary constituency of Hinckley and Bosworth, where we hope to be putting pressure on the Conservatives at the general election. And I think that's the pattern you're going to see over the next 24, 48 hours. In the areas that we're looking to put pressure on the Conservatives, come the general election, we will be making progress and we will be making gains. And that's what you need to look for. OK, well, let's talk to Sonia Soda, who's the chief leader writer for The Observer. Um, Sonia, we've been talking a lot about the mayoral races already. We've been talking about the pressure specifically on the Conservatives a lot, but you understand what the Labour Party extremely well. Talk us through what is a realistic expectation coming from the Labour Party tonight what would they, and what they would be disappointed by and what they would be pleased by. Well, I think there's a bit of a spectrum uh, for the Labour Party, and I think there's lots of different things going on, as you've already been talking about, to focus on. So there's the local council results, there's these very high profile mayoral elections and, you know, a sort of if a Labour victory in um, either the West Midlands, for example, or in Tees Valley, that could sort of shift some of the narrative that we're seeing over the next 24 hours. But one of the key things to look for will be uh, the BBC calculations on the projected national vote share based on the local election results and um, you know I think Labour will be looking to um, sort of show that 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 lead that we're seeing in um, the polls is actually filtering through to election results when you're talking about the projected national vote share. And that PNS, as we call it, we'll probably have that for you and for everybody else sometime tomorrow afternoon when we've had a chance to put enough results into our giant calculator to come up with something that's credible. Last year in the PNS, the projected national share, Labour was ahead by 9%. The national polls imply they should be a fair amount further forward than that. Yes, they do. But what you've got to take into account uh, when you're looking at what's going on is the fact that um, there are fewer seats up for grabs um, in terms of local election seats. So that's local councillors that we're talking about. And also a lot of the um, elections that are taking place at the local level are in areas where Labour are already in control of the council. So um, I think that's right. So you, a good night would be them making gains on that 9% lead that we saw um, uh, you know, a year ago. But I think um, it would be too high an expectation uh, to think that the poll lead that we're seeing would trans translate itself into um, that vote share. So it's probably higher than 9% that they will be looking at for a good night, but lower than, um, you know, where the poll lead is. OK, Sonia, thanks so much. Um, in the last few minutes, we can tell you that Labour has taken another award from the Conservatives in Sunderland. So just building their lead there. Remember, they didn't have to... Uh, changed the council they've been holding the council already they didn't have to grab it from the conservatives but they have taken another ward from the conservatives there in sunderland which at this stage is still the only council result that we have got in just to remind you because sonia was talking there about the projected national share that's the statistic that we can come up with that tells us what would have happened if this elections these elections had been fought everywhere in the UK. So it doesn't tell us what the general election results is going to be, but it gives us a picture, a snapshot of what the results would have been in terms of share for all of the parties if the general election had, if the, these council elections had taken place in every corner of the country. That's my little health warning for you on the PNS, as we call it, which we'll have sometime tomorrow afternoon. In a second, we're going to be back in Blackpool South to check in with what's going on there. But Chris, just in terms of these vote shares, mm. I mean, that really is what the political parties will be eager to see, potentially thrilled or horrified by. Yes, because they can measure their current popularity, but also look back and see rate of progress or decline from last year's local elections and previous ones, and then benchmark that with how their performance 
is now and therefore could be at the general election. Again, by looking at how that compares uh, to the kind of charts that Rita was showing us earlier on. One other thing, just to quickly mention, uh, Laura, I'm hearing from several sources that quite a lot of the counting in lots of places is taking longer than had been anticipated, courtesy of the fact that we've got so many different elections going on. Uh, which makes the job of those doing nocturnal arithmetic even more complicated. And we were talking a few minutes ago, seeing those pictures from Blackpool, mm -hmm. where it looked like they might be approaching finishing. Mm -hmm. I hear they haven't actually started yet. Well, get the coffee on, because so, it might be yeah. an even longer <laughs> night than we are being anticipating. But there are plenty and plenty and plenty of things that we can talk about, because the overall political context in an election year is endlessly fascinating, mm. if you're... Uh, as as inclined as I am, but there's tons, tons and tons to talk through. Just to go back to that concept of share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, last year, the gap between the two big parties was 9%. If we compare it to 1996, and you knew it was not going to be a while before we started having historical comparisons. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think you lot were already talking about the 1920s. So um, in 1996, that share, Labour was 16% mm -hmm. ahead in these local elections. Yeah. Um, do you think they feel there'll be anything like that tonight? Because it's a sort of parlour game often. People say, oh, is it more like 1997 or is it more like another year? What's really going and, on here? And that parlour game is absolutely key, isn't it? Because you do get that comparison that's made between 92 and 97. And these comparisons are never perfect. And politically, things have changed since the 1990s. The, the significance of uh, parties other than the lab Labour and the Conservatives much greater uh, right now. The, the key thing in the end is going to be, from Labour's perspective and indeed from the Conservative perspective, is does this set of data, and in particular that projected national share, point to and reflect what we're seeing in opinion polls and point to and reflect, therefore, if you are looking at those opinion polls and then looking at the so-called PNS, that there is a reasonable prospect of a change in government come the general election. And we should emphasise that. I know it's a point that the likes of you, me and, you and me mm -hmm. say the whole time. Yes, we've had this whole stack of opinion polls for months on end now, suggesting Labour a country mile ahead. Mm -hmm. But they have one heck of a mountain to overcome to even sneak over the line with the tiniest of uh, majorities. Keir Starmer has to perform better mm -hmm. in terms of a swing than Tony Blair managed in 1997. So that is the scale of the challenge uh, that Labour face. And that's why looking at that number whenever we get it in the middle of what is now this afternoon, Friday <laughs> afternoon, uh, will, that will be a key mood maker. Even though, as we, as we know, there are several, or there'll be lots and lots more results to come. Uh, beyond that point throughout the weekend. OK, thanks so much, Chris. Now, now, we've talked already a lot about Blackpool South. Let's go there and talk to the candidate for who's been standing to become with the hope of being Reform's first MP, Mark Butcher. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. How do you think you've done? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, well, I'm quietly confident. Quietly confident of what? Sorry, the question... I just need to hear the question again. You say you're quietly confident, Mark, but quietly confident of what? We're quietly confident of making a good showing here today in Blackpool South. And a good showing would mean that you have made it potentially into second place behind Labour ahead of the Conservatives? Well, that would be a fantastic good showing. But uh, I'm, only, I'm here to win it, so I just have to be honest with you and say I'm here today to win this by-election. And from what you've heard so far, and having been out on the doorsteps and I'm sure looking at the votes as they are being verified and being beginning to be counted there tonight, what do you think is a realistic outcome? And when you say you're there to win it, that would be an enormous surprise, I think, to everybody, but there have been some possibility, some expectation that you might just sneak into second. So what's realistic, do you think? Well, realistic is second place, yes, of course. Uh, but as I say, I, I, I'm here tonight to win this by-election for the good people of Blackpool South. And why do you think you've been able to appeal to them? Well, because, first of all, uh, people in Blackpool are fed up. We are, we are sick and tired of the false promises 
by the Labour Council that we've dealt with here for the last 12 years and by the Conservative government that have just failed us in every single, in every single way. We've had three local MPs, uh, um, Conservative MPs here, from the Fylde to Blackpool South in Blackpool North, that have all failed the good people of Blackpool and we are completely fed up of it. I think that's why I appeal to people, because it's common sense policies for common sense people with Reform UK. Hello Mark, it's uh, Chris Mason here, evening to you. I wonder when you've been out and about knocking on the doors and talking to people in Blackpool, uh, those who have said that they'd be willing to support you, where they've said their political support's been in, in the past. Are, are you attracting former Conservative voters in the main or Labour voters? Where do you think your vote's coming from? We're, we're collecting votes from both sides of the party. I've spoken today to many, many Labour supporters who are actually voting for me. Uh, but particularly in the Conservative heartlands, that's where uh, we're having the most impact. And the, the story on the door, uh, people are talking, they are coming out in their droves. And what, and what do you say to the critique? We've heard it from Chris Eaton Harris, uh, Conservative Cabinet Minister, this evening, that a, a, a vote for reform particularly come the general election, is effectively a vote to put Keir Starmer in Downing Street. Is, is that something you'd be comfortable with? Not at all. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? And that depends from which side of the spe spectrum you, you, you're from. Um, well, I, I don't think a, a vote for Reform UK here in Blackpool is a, is a vote for Labour or Conservative. A vote for Reform UK is a vote for reform. And that we're the only party that's committed to change, and that's what's attractive for people here in Blackpool South. We are fed up and um, it's, we've had enough. Mark Richard, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with you. We'll certainly be thank back you. in Blackpool South. Thank you for joining us. And uh, the enthusiastic Lib Dem um, activist who was trying to get in the shot there behind you, Mark, was, did very well not to be distracted. Um, Chris Heaton-Harris, uh, he says people are totally fed up. Well, what do you think, say to that? I, I think people, I mean, I, uh, local elections and indeed by-elections always do have much lower turnouts and that demonstrates a, a, a type of apathy which you could read across as being fed up. And yes, I th do think people want to see politicians delivering on the promises they have made. That is why, um, you know, Rishi made uh, five commitments when he came in. Um, I think we can safely say the, the pledge on halving inflation has 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 happened because we've gone from over 11% to just over 3%. But the, one of the most important ones in, in that was stopping the boats. We haven't been able to stop the boats yet. We've got this Rwanda policy that Labour and the Lib Dems constantly vote against, which is now obviously being uh, having a deterrent effect or perceived deterrent attack, uh, effect um, amongst those coming here illegally. So we will, I think, we will start to see delivery on that and, and on all of our pledges as well. Well, you mentioned there a deterrent effect of your Rwanda policy. In your role as Northern Ireland Secretary, as we've got you here, um, Ireland and the UK have been <coughs> having, as we understand, some quite tricky discussions about what to do about people who appear to have been going from Northern Ireland into Ireland in the South. Um, what are you going to do about it? Um, well, well, firstly, uh, again, this is a perceived deterrent effect. Um, and, so and, it is, and, 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 and no, it is, it is obviously working, and the, uh, I believe there's been interviews in the press of people who've said they've gone to Ireland um, to uh, 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 to claim asylum uh, there because of our Rwanda policy. Um, there is actually a common travel area, uh, which is in, extremely important across uh, uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland, um, which means there is no border. There is no border because of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. There is no border and should be no border because of the Windsor framework. Um, and so we need to work to make sure, uh, I had a very good conversation with the, two, uh, with the Tornisha, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland yesterday, about trying to make sure that the common travel area's exterior borders are protected. But the Irish government has said there's an agreement with, you, with the UK that could allow them to return asylum seekers to the UK, and the UK said it has no legal obligation to do that. So what are you going to do about it? I mean, there seems to be a well, standoff I mean, here. There, uh, there is no legal obligation, and indeed, in all the time that this agreement's been going, I think only one um, asylum seeker has gone in, in, in any direction. Um, so, uh, but that's the point here is that we need to work with our, our colleagues in Ireland to make sure that the uh, the common travel area, its external borders are protected. I just want to say also, you, you said the deterrent effect is clearly working. In fact, anyone who was watching the news earlier today will have seen that 711 migrants crossed the channel yesterday. 
that's the highest daily total so far this year. And the total for this year is more than 8,000 people. That's an increase of a third on the equivalent period of last year. Yeah, but so if, you, if, if the deterrent effect is working, how does that stuck up with well, a I mean, record number of people Well, obviously, the deterrent effect coming? is working because there are people who are choosing to go uh, to go elsewhere rather than try and come to uh, the United Kingdom. The, but, the but point is... On. If they've made it to Northern Ireland and into Ireland, they've crossed the channel to get to the UK. Yeah, and, the, uh, and if the deterrent effect is meant to be stopping people crossing the channel, which is the dangerous journey that you and the Prime Minister say you want to bring that absolutely. to an end, the highest number so far this year came yesterday. Yeah, which it's is why we working, need to make sure that, that we see planes go to Rwanda with... Uh, with uh, people who've come here illegally on. And, uh, and actually, um, you know, what we want to make sure is uh, that we have the strongest uh, policy in, in this space. And there is a perceived view that, uh, one, this is a deterrent, and two, that Labour, if they came in, wouldn't do anything in this space. And there'd be just a kind of amnesty that allows people to stay. <laughs> so uh, you've got a draw in one way and a, a deterrent in another. OK, well, we'll come back to that issue, I'm sure, through the night, because it's something that's very important to lots of uh, voters, very important, I'm sure, also to a lot of you watching here tonight. Let's, though, Rita, go in behind one of the results that we're getting through. In Newcastle, they're still counting, but we can have a look at some of the numbers that are interesting. They really are. I mean, the night is young, and so, of course, we pour over what we have. But this is an interesting uh, set of figures. So they're still counting in Newcastle. You can see we've got three seats in. But this is the shape of change since the last time these seats were voted on. It's the change since 2021, which is the last time that these seats were up. Now, all three seats are Labour holds, but you can see that the Labour uh, vote share has just gone up by 1% one percentage point since 2021. Conservatives massively down at uh, minus 10%. And look who's benefited, the Lib Dems and the Greens. Now, one of these three seats is in a ward called um, South uh, Jesmond, which is quite a studenty area. Is that a factor in the shape of of, of this. So we'll be watching Newcastle very closely. It's a Labour council. It's been Labour, Labour since 2011. It was Lib Dem before then. Um, we'll come back to this once we've got some more of those seats in. Now, if you want to know more about what's going on tonight, you can, of course, go to the BBC website and you'll get all sorts of information about the results, analysis as well. And you can put your postcode in and find out what's going on in your own council. So you can find it at this address, but also, of course, on the news app. Lord. Bridget, thanks. For, uh, Rita, thanks very much. Bridget, that's, you know, not far from your patch, Newcastle. You can see there from those early results, actually, potentially it's a student vote, potentially whoever knows what's happening, but people are choosing the Greens and not going over to you. I mean, there's always been that kind of dimension in Newcastle and that kind of volatility there. But I would just say alongside that, it's becoming clear to us this evening that we have, that we've gained that we will gain Hartlepool tonight, oh. um, which would be a brilliant result for us. So I think, uh, you know, at one level, we can talk about one mm -hmm. result in Newcastle, but actually to gain Hartlepool, particularly after that devastating result we saw in 2021, would demonstrate really massive progress for us. It was a must and win, though, wasn't it? We're getting back Hartlepool. Well, we did really well in the local elections last year, um, and it would demonstrate that we are on track to uh, form the next government. Okay, we're well, making thank you that kind of, those kinds of strides forward. Okay, thank you for bringing us that snippet of news. Bridget and Manira, we're going to say goodbye to you in just a few minutes' time as we hurtle towards the one o'clock news. Just before we do, though, we've talked a lot about the Midlands and the north of England. Let's go to the south of England now and talk to Peter Henley, who's the political editor for BBC South. Now, you're in the council area of Rushmore. We've mentioned it briefly tonight, Peter, but tell us why it's important and what do you think is going to happen? Uh, this is a Labour target in the south of England, Aldershot, home of the British Army. People here usually very loyal. They've had a Conservative MP in this constituency since 1918. Continuously Conservative. This council for 50 years led by Conservatives. And Labour are smiling tonight. And the Conservatives not at all happy. Uh, there's a good chance of change on this council in the south of England. Uh, and that would be very interesting because under Corbyn's leadership, uh, the Labour vote went down. Under Keir Starmer in a military area, it's looking a lot better for them. And Peter, that's the Tory Labour battle. What about the Tory Lib Dem battle in your part of the country? 
away from here, there's the Blue Wall. Uh, Dorset Council, which is counting tomorrow, is where Ed Davies been visiting and a lot of campaigning going on. Again, a very conservative area, but all the seats are up. Uh, and so a lot to play for for the Liberal Democrats there. Wokingham in Berkshire is another council that they run, but they'd like to have overall control. Uh, and Portsmouth, a uh, similar target for them. Uh, I'd say also there's some reform, four reform candidates here. That might have hit the Conservative vote uh, here at Rushmore. Uh, but another, another point about this, I think, which is a fascinating council, which is that Jeremy Hunt is the neighbouring constituency in northwest Surrey, and on the other side, Michael Gove in Surrey Heath. So they'll be looking closely at Labour's progress here. Peter, thank you so much. It's always good to see people scurrying around in the background with ballot boxes looking purposeful. Um, there haven't been that many results through tonight. We hear it is taking longer than it might have done because these results are such a complicated jigsaw as we try to unpick what's going on through the night. But we will be bringing you the results as they come in. In a second, we're going to go to the news, but we're going to thank Bridget Phillipson and Manira Wilson for the Lib Dems for being with us here in the first time of the programme. Let's remind you of the totals so far. Not much on our giant scoreboard there, but you can see in our tower behind me, Labour on 16 seats having gained three, the Lib Dems on three and the Tories having lost three. So in wins and losses, we're still there for in single figures. A long way to go, but plenty of interesting things already starting to emerge. Now, though, let's check in with the news with Regini Vijanathan. Thanks, Laura. Votes are being counted in the local elections in parts of England in the last major test of public opinion before the general election. Labour have said they hope the results will signify real progress and have retained control of Sunderland Council in the first result declared. The Conservatives have acknowledged they're expecting a difficult evening. The outcome of the by-election in Blackpool South is expected overnight, as well as results from around of the third of the councils involved. Here's our political correspondent Damien Grammaticus with the latest. Up for grabs in these elections, two and a half thousand council seats, 11 mayoral jobs, and here in Blackpool South, one Westminster seat. It's one of the consequential battles tonight. Labour hopeful they can take it off the Conservatives. Well, the first result we'll look for is the Blackpool uh, by-election, uh, which is the only result where Rishi Sunak and the government are really on the ballot paper. And if we can gain that, that will show real progress uh, on the way to the coming general election. But Labour have other targets too. Rushmore in Hampshire, a Southern Conservative Council. The Conservative Minister here at the Count, his party braced for losses of seats won back when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister. The last time most of these seats were fought was in 2021, where we had effectively a vaccine bounce as we rolled out the COVID vaccine. That was our best set of local elections since 2008. So that's a very high base. So compared to that, uh, it is going to be difficult to achieve on that. In Hull, an alarm and an evacuation. Whether Conservatives think these elections signal trouble ahead for them will depend on the scale of any losses. In Stockport, where they're counting in a car park, Liberal Democrats could make gains from Labour. But what they're most focused on are the places they face off with Conservatives. Across the country, we've heard that people are absolutely fed up of the Conservatives. And across the blue wall, life on Conservatives are switching to the Liberal Democrats, so we're very optimistic. People want to cast a verdict on the Conservatives' appalling record on the NHS and care, on the fact they've allowed the water companies to pump their sewage into our rivers and the cost of living crisis. Hartlepool is one place Conservatives are looking to. Labour may gain control of the council, but the mayoral vote should be different. That isn't being counted tonight, but what will emerge in the coming hours will paint a picture of how voters feeling right across the country. Damien Grammaticus, BBC News. In other news, John Swinney looks set to become Scotland's next First Minister after his main potential rival, Kate Forbes, said she wouldn't be standing for the leadership of the SNP and instead gave him her support. Mr Swinney's the only candidate to put himself forward, but nominations are open until next week. At a news conference, he said he wanted to unite the party. My message is crisp and simple. 
I am stepping forward to bring the SNP together, to deliver economic growth and social justice, to deliver the very best future for everyone in a modern, dynamic, diverse Scotland. I want to unite the SNP and unite Scotland for independence. John Swinney there. A man's appeared in court charged with the murder of the schoolboy Daniel Anjoran in North East London. Daniel, who was 14, was on his way to school when he was fatally stabbed in Hainault on Tuesday. Marcus Monzo, who's 36, also faces several other charges, including two counts of attempted murder. President Biden's broken his silence on the nationwide pro-Palestinian protests which have been taking place at universities across the United States. He was speaking after riot police moved in to dismantle a pro-Palestinian camp at the University of California in Los Angeles. At least 200 people were arrested in the raid. Mr Biden said the rule of law must be respected. Anti-war protests have spread to about 50 campus sites. While most have been peaceful, tensions have been high at a number of universities in the past few days. The foreign secretaries met with President Zelensky in Kyiv to discuss the military equipment being sent to Ukraine by the UK. Lord Cameron said it would include precision-guided bombs and air defence missiles, which could be used by Ukraine against targets inside Russia. Take That have become the latest act to move shows away from the troubled co-op live arena in Manchester, which has been plagued by delays to its opening. For the third time on Wednesday night, its doors remain closed due to technical problems, with fans already queuing up outside. The venue said it would be taking a short pause and would open on May the 14th. Well, a reminder that you can follow all of the election results overnight on the BBC News website or on the app. You can also see who's won and where using our postcode checker. You can find that at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Now it's time to return to Laura and the team and elections 2024. A very warm welcome back to Election Night on the BBC 2024. We've got a complicated and fascinating jigsaw of council, mayoral and all sorts of other elections going on that you've been voting on today. And the results are starting to become in tonight, but it will take a couple of days before the overall picture becomes clear. With us for the next while here in the studio, panel of top politicians. We're still joined by Chris Heaton harris the Northern Ireland Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, the Shadow Business Secretary for the Labour Party has just joined us, and Sarah Olney, the Liberal Democrats Treasury Spokesperson. A very warm welcome to you all. Let's show you what is going on so far. We don't have that many results at this stage, but there we go. The Conservatives have lost four council seats. Labour has gained five and no change so far for the Liberal Democrats. There are 107 councils up for grabs that you've been voting on today, but we'll only have 37 results in overnight. What we do hope to have, though, before not too long, is the result of the Blackpool South by-election. It came up for grabs and Labour very much hopes that they will take it because the former Conservative MP quit in disgrace. One of the interesting things there, and we were just hearing from the Reform UK candidate, is how well they have done. How much of the Conservative vote have they managed to eat into? He suggested potentially they might get the Tories into second place. That would be a big deal and would spook Conservative MPs. But let's see what happens and we'll be back in Blackpool South before too long. You can see some of the counters sitting around, but we think the count has not quite got underway. Let's take you then to Exeter in the southwest. People concentrating hard on their clipboards. That's what we like to see. Um, that is the kind of place where Labour will want to show that they are doing OK. The Greens have been eating into their majority in the last few years. You can see a Green there concentrating hard on what's happening. We'll bring you that result as we have it. Let's then go to Plymouth. Now, Labour took that last year after splits in the Conservative group. There was a huge local row about trees in the city. All politics is local, they say. But it's also a very interesting place in the context of what happens on the council because right now, the two um, 
Westminster seats are held by one Conservative, Johnny Mercer, the Veterans Minister, and Luke Pollard, who is the Shadow Defence, one of the Shadow Defence team, and that will be very tightly fought in the general election. So we'll be keeping a close eye on what happens at Plymouth, not just because of the importance of the local council, but because of the context too. And there is Rushmoor. Now that's a council in Hampshire. And as we were hearing from Peter Henley, on the ground there a few minutes ago just before the news labor is hopeful of taking that council it would matter not just because it's a labor taking a council in the south of england which is notable in and of itself given what's happened in the last few years but also because it has the town of aldershot which is the home of much of the british military and if you think of the context of the last few years, how hard Keir Starmer has worked to try to say that Labour is a party that can be trusted with the country's security, it would be interesting to see that happen in that part of the world. Now then, let's go to Bolton. Now that's been a Labour minority council. They're short of four seats. Um, at the moment, there's a mixture of Labour and Conservative seats in Bolton. And that is one of those places where we'll be looking out also for what happens to the votes from Muslim constituents. Now, you might think, why are people picking out one particular group? But we know that that has been particularly of interest because there's been a lot of unhappiness, particularly among the Muslim community, but also with some other Labour voters over Keir Starmer's position on the conflict in Gaza and his refusal to call for an immediate ceasefire. So that's why we're picking out that particular group of voters and we'll see if there is a discernible trend there overnight. Let's then go to Grimsby. This is like an A to Z of the country. Uh, Grimsby up on the coast of the east of England. Very leavy area. Um, Conservative MPs there, but uh, Labour hoping very much to make progress on the Council of North East Lincolnshire. And I'm sure before too long, we'll be talking to our colleague Tim Ardale there on the ground. The Tories have to defend nearly all of the seats that are being contested <coughs> to hold on. Right now, two Tory MPs. The council has been held by the, by the Tories since 2012. But North East Lincolnshire is somewhere that is or should be, in theory, in Labour sites to show progress there if indeed the national polls are to be believed. Somewhere where Labour should be feeling good though, in that same vein, is Redditch. Now, Redditch in the Midlands, just outside the West Midlands mayoralty area. We've already been talking a lot about the mayors, but Redditch is the kind of part of the country, again, where Labour really ought to be making convincing gains. And Redditch, we understand, we think it's on their target list for the night. Somewhere, that has definitely been on their target. And we think we were hearing from Bridget Phillipson that they believe they've taken that council is Hartlepool. Uh, my colleague David McMillan is there for us. Um, David, are Labour confirming that on the ground to you? Yes, they are. They are officially claiming victory here in Hartlepool. Now, we don't have the official result yet. In fact, it seems like it's going to be quite some way off. We had hoped we would get the declaration at about half past one. That might be slipping to about two o'clock. But Labour do believe they, they have done enough to win Hartlepool Council. They were confident they would be able to do so. The maths was very much in their favour. They were only defending two of the 12 seats. They only needed two gains on top of that to take a majority in the council. And they certainly believe that that's what they've done. In a statement, a Labour Party spokesperson said, winning back Hartlepool Council is a groundbreaking moment after the disappointing results we saw here in 2021. So Labour certainly claiming victory. As I say, we don't have an official result yet. It might be a good hour or so before we hear that. If Labour are right, that if they have one here in Hartlepool, as they say they have, it would mean that former teacher Brenda Harrison would be the next leader of Hartlepool Council and she would be the first woman to lead this council. Dave, thank you very much indeed there. So Labour confirming on the ground a statement from a spokesperson that they have taken Hartlepool Council. Now, we've been talking just there about what's happening in the North East. Rita, though, let's go to a different part of the country. Where can you show us what's been going on? Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire. So <laughs> We've Tory got, stronghold should absolutely. be theoretically. Well, and, and, it, and it still is, but some interesting stuff is going on. Uh, let me show you just where it is. Um, for those of you who don't know, it'll come leaping out at you. There you go. This is Broxbourne in Hertfordshire. It is very true blue. It's been Conservative for the last 50 years, and it still is. The Conservatives couldn't lose this council tonight. Uh, they've just counted all the seats. They needed 16 seats for the winning person. As you can see, the Conservatives have got 27, but it's interesting to see 
what has happened to the share of the vote, because look at that, down 13 percentage points since three years ago, which is the last time that these seats were counted. And look who's benefited. Labour up by 5%, the Greens up by 9%. So really interesting to see the Conservatives going backwards in one of their heartlands. Um, a little earlier, we were talking about Newcastle. I promised to update you as more results were coming in. So we've now got six seats counted here, um, and they're still counting, as you can see. And let's just take a look at a share, the share of the vote. Interesting, isn't it? Labour down a smidge, Conservatives down uh, 8%, and it's the Greens and the Liberal Democrats who, again, are benefiting. And I can tell you that the Greens have taken uh, a, a ward off Labour as well within that. So uh, we'll, we'll keep, keep, keep an eye on everything that's going on. I'm being told that the Lib Dems have also taken two seats as well off Labour. So we'll keep coming back and I'll keep bringing you more. Laura. Thanks, Rita. That's really interesting. And I'm just <clears throat> hearing where the... Um, Lib Dems and the Greens have taken place, particularly where the Greens have had made progress in Newcastle is, we understand, an area with a high Muslim population. Mm. Now, Chris, we were just saying a few minutes ago, there's a reason why we're picking out that group of voters. It might sound a bit strange to some people's ears, but there's a specific reason. How concerned is Labour HQ about that? They are nervous about it, and not least because tonight and the coming days might offer a greater picture than they've been afforded so far because of the scale and range of electoral contests that we'll, we will get results from. The extent to which that they are losing support uh, amongst people, particularly in areas where there is a significant Muslim population, who have not liked Keir Starmer's attitude towards the conflict in the Middle East in, in the view of uh, some within the Labour Party. There's been a desire that they would have a bolder position on calling for a ceasefire sooner. Mm. Keir Starmer's argument is that that would not be right. And so Labour will be very conscious of keeping an eye on that because in the way that we've talked already tonight about the, the threat the Conservatives face from reform mm -hmm. and the fear from their perspective that whilst reform might not win many seats they could take significant numbers of votes from them that allow Labour to win in particular places the fear for Labour would be that that could have a similar impact on them now on the whole uh, these seats tend to be in areas where Labour certainly in parliamentary terms performs very very well mm -hmm. and therefore the scope for them to lose votes and still hold on to seats is significant but it'd be really interesting just on, on a very live hugely contentious topic that for some people is very very important in determining how they might vote let's see as the night goes on if the likes of that uh, result that we just saw in the Elzig ward in Newcastle mm -hmm. plays out around around the country. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because traditionally, of course, there have been some moments where it has made a very big difference, but traditionally, foreign policy mm. is not often something that shifts significant numbers of votes in the UK. Quite, quite. And yet, here we have a something going on in the Middle East in the last six mm. or seven months that has been hugely dominating in terms of headlines, that is hugely polarising and angering for many people, where there's every prospect that that conflict is going to remain salient and newsworthy in the months in the countdown to the general election. Just a month or so back, I was in Rochdale covering the by-election there, mm. another area in Greater Manchester with a significant Muslim population. And yes, there is that sense, isn't there, that so often it's all about the domestic when it comes to elections. My goodness, covering that by-election, it was very, very abundantly clear. And yes, an atypical part mm. of the UK, but nonetheless, uh, an interesting one and one where there are similarities elsewhere that the situation in the Middle East was playing really, really big for a lot of people. Well, let's put that then to Jonathan Reynolds. Um, welcome to you and Sarah joining us and Chris here in the studio. Was Keir Starmer's initial approach to the conflict in Israel actually too strident or not sympathetic enough to the concerns of some of your Muslim voters? Well, I think it was the right stance, but there's no doubt it's had some problems for us. That that can be the case in politics. I think you've always got to caveat that by saying, you know, any community in this country is not a monolithic one. There's diversity of views within that community. You shouldn't just treat it as one group of people with one common view. But, yeah, there's been a harder element to that. We've seen that in this campaign, particularly with, I think, younger um, British Muslim voters. But 
we will take that on board and work harder to win that trust and faith of those people back. Okay. And I wouldn't necessarily say, however, you, you then look back and say, should we have had a different stance on that? This is a very difficult conflict and there are frankly limitations on what any British politician can do to bring this horrendous situation to a close. But yeah, it's been a difficult part of the campaign. And, no and nobody would deny the, the complexity and the sensitivity of the issues involved. But you have seen over time that Keir Starmer's approach has perhaps come closer to people in the party who were unhappy with his language, his use of language, particularly in one interview at the beginning when he talked about Israel's right to self-defence and also some of its tactics. Do you think you should do more not just to work with, as you said, you'll work hard with voters who are disaffected by it, but actually maybe to show some acknowledgement to them that he acknowledges he really upset some people? Look, I think our position as it stands today, is, is the right one, which is to call for an immediate ceasefire, to say humanitarian aid has to get into Gaza, that mm -hmm. we want to see this conflict come to an end. But there are, there are two sides to a conflict, mm -hmm. and both have to agree to a ceasefire. And we, if only we could bring those two sides to a ceasefire, that is what we would want to do. We've had to clarify, you know, you mentioned a specific mm -hmm. interview, we've, we did have to clarify that. But I, I would say again, you know, <clears throat> there, are not, there are not easy positions on a, on a conflict which is, is so long running, so polarised, so difficult. I understand how strongly people feel. I imagine all of us feel very strongly we would like that conflict to and come. And how concerned are you about losing significant numbers of votes tonight because of what's happened? Well, I mean, we want to see across the whole of the United Kingdom, not just success in the contest tonight, but progress towards Labour winning support in the areas of the country we have to win in order to form a government. So every voter in those areas, every voter in these contests is important to us. And I think when we get the aggregate results, when we've got the full picture, we will see that progress being made. But that is a test of the night for Labour. OK, and we should remind people, as you say, the full set of results will take some time. We'll just remind you of some of that chronology. We'll get a lot of council results tonight. We'll get the Blackpool South by-election tonight. We might possibly get one police and crime commissioner result tonight, but a lot of them will come in then tomorrow. The big mayoral result in Tees Valley will be tomorrow afternoon. The West Midlands mayoral <coughs> result will be Saturday afternoon. And then, if you're still with me by then, the London mayoral result, I think, will actually be on Saturday night. So this is an election weekend of glorious political nerdery rather than an election night when it's all going to come in thick and fast. Um, Sarah, do you think, in, you know, if we looked at... Rita was showing us some of the result in Newcastle. Do you think you've been able to profit because of some of the difficulties we've just been talking about with Jonathan? Um, I don't really want to sort of think about it in, in those terms, because obviously what's going on in, in the Middle East right now is, is horrific, and lots of people in this country feel incredibly strongly about it. Even mm -hmm. just earlier today, I was, uh, you know, trying to get the vote out in, in my own seat in Richmond Park, and there was a lady there who told me that, uh, you know, this was the most important issue to her, and that would be, you know, how she was casting her vote. So, you know, it is something that, it, that has moved so many people, and it's not really surprising when you see some of the horrific pictures on our screens. And the Liberal Democrats, you know, we, very early on, we were calling for a, an immediate bilateral ceasefire. We wanted to see aid getting in. We wanted to get hostages out. But, you know, critically, that being at the first step on the road towards a lasting peace. And that's always been our position. Um, and it's something I think lots of people have welcomed. They've uh, welcomed our leadership on this. Our uh, foreign affairs spokesperson, Leila Moran, in particular, mm -hmm. has been very, very prominent on this issue because, of course, she, she has, has Palestinian in heritage Gaza, yes. and she has family in Gaza. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people have, have welcomed the Liberal Democrats' stance on this. But it's, it's such a serious issue. Mm -hmm. Everything Jonathan was just saying there about... It, it's a very, very complex conflict. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, I don't really want to start talking about a few council seat gains in Newcastle in that context. Sure. Although, obviously, is, very pleased to see them. <laughs> very sensitive yes. and very complicated. Yes. But also, voters do want to hear what their politicians believe and what their politicians think the solutions are, and then sometimes they have very strong reactions to them. But for Liberal Democrats here in around the country, aside from that issue, what's been coming up on, on the doorsteps? By and large, it's, it's actually the more bread and butter things. It's about not being able to get an appointment with your GP. It's about not being able to see a dentist. Lots of people extremely concerned about 
uh, the quality of their local environment, particularly, uh, as you know, sewage in rivers is something that really, really upsets a lot of people. So those are the sorts of things. It is about their local environment and their local services. Um, and But it, it, time and time again, I'm hearing from Conservative voters, in my seat in particular, but elsewhere, that they are sick to death of the Conservatives, uh, that they, uh, you know, the Conservatives are not listening uh, to their concerns, that the Conservatives, you know, are, are just taking them for fools in many ways. And, and I think that we will see significant uh, fall in uh, Conservative vote share. OK, well, let's talk on exactly that, because we can show you from our numbers so far what's been going on with the vote share that we're able to calculate by collecting statistics in different pockets of the country. So this is the change since 2021, the last time these seats were up. And you can see there the Tories down by 15%, Labour up by 4 which is, you know, distinct but not convincing. And they had a bad year in 2021, the Labour Party, and the Tories had a very good year. You can see the smaller parties there, the Lib Dems up by 1, the Greens up by 5, the Reform Party, which back then was the Brexit Party, up by 8%. And the independents there, you often get lots of hardworking individuals standing on the councils off their own back. However, let's look then at the change since last year. Now, this is really interesting. This has been a terrible year for the Conservatives in all sorts of ways. Theoretically, a good year for the Labour Party in all sorts of ways, with very significant national poll leads. But look there, vote share down by 0.4% last, since last year. The Conservatives down by 3% and the Lib Dems down by 2% too. And the Greens benefiting by 2 And the Reform Party, REF there in the turquoise, gaining by 4%. Now, it is 1.26 in the morning. This is our first stab at what the change in the share of the vote is going to look like. So it is early days. As I say, but these are calculations that are put together very carefully. And as things stand, it looks like since last year, 2023, maybe there hasn't been very much change at all. And that is what our early analysis is suggesting, that where there's no reform candidate standing, there doesn't seem to have been that much movement between the Conservatives and the Labour Party since last year. So it may well be that the two main parties are kind of as you were by the end of this election weekend. Let's see. One of the issues for voters, of course, as we've been hearing from our politicians, and as, as you all know, of course, is what's going on in people's wallets. The economy, which has struggled so much, everybody's been feeling hard, hard up because of the cost of inflation. We know inflation has been slowing down, um, which the government is very happy to remind us of, as it was Royal and Rishi Sunak's key targets. But what is stacking up for the weeks and months ahead? Faisal Islam is joining us from the newsroom. Faisal, I knew you couldn't help yourself. Stay up with us during election night. It's great to have you with us. Let's look ahead first about what might be coming down the tracks. Yeah, morning, Laura. I think it is morning, isn't it? Uh, or very <laughs> late so. evening. Um, yeah, I think when uh, whatever the numbers you guys are crunching in terms of the political impact, both for the public in terms of general election, but also in terms of the argument Downing Street might have to make with their own MPs if these results disappoint. Uh, obviously, the economic context looms large, particularly in the next few days, actually. You've heard a lot from both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor about an economic turnaround. And some of those numbers, well, haven't quite been there yet. We do get a crucial set of numbers really in the next few days. We have uh, on next Friday, it is highly likely that the brief recession at the end of next year will be called as officially over, that the economy will be shown to have grown over the first quarter of this year. That's the official end to what was a brief, mild technical recession. The day before that, on the Thursday, we'll get from the Bank of England perhaps a sort of pathway or a glide path for interest rate cuts at some point over the course of the year. And then in a couple of weeks' time, we should see the inflation rate, you just described it, come down pretty close to the Bank of England's target of 2% a normal rate of inflation. So some figures that might sort of underline a, a story of a turnaround in the economy. 
Um, I know that in Downing Street they've been looking very carefully at the consumer confidence numbers. You know, when I go out and speak to people uh, about the economy, they reflect what you've just said, which is people perhaps don't notice those growth rates. They don't notice the GDP numbers. They notice that the price level is much higher than it was two or three years ago, and they feel that squeeze. Um, but the, in Downing Street, they've been looking at the consumer confidence numbers. They still, in general, look pretty bad. But one sub-measure of consumer confidence, which is people's idea of their kind of personal wealth over the next 12 months, has just, just about gone positive to plus two, dizzy heights of plus two. And they feel that that is uh, a little bit of light in terms of where the public might feel about their public finances and where they may feel, perhaps, for a general election in autumn. Just give us, though, a sense of the context, Faisal. You know, everybody knows that they have had a hard time. You go to the supermarket, things are so much more expensive. Wages have been rising now, but they hadn't for such a long time for many people. In terms of the, the, the big picture, what's the, what, what have we just sort of lived through, if you like, the economic background to this? We lived through an unprecedented squeeze on living standards caused by double-digit inflation, which has eaten into everyone's living standards. Right now, though, wage growth is just ahead of inflation, so real wages are, are rising again. But the real question about the election and the economic backdrop to the election is how much do people feel this? And this is not just a problem here for this election. I've just been in America where you get the same problem for President Biden, where actually the economy is growing really fast and people say that they don't feel it. So this is the big challenge. You will hear a lot, I think, about economic turnaround this month. And you'll hear a lot from Downing Street communicating to their MPs, just hold on. We've got some data just around the corner that might help make the argument to the public that, that three years of rolling crisis, much of which have come from around the world, some of which was domestically generated, that we can start to draw a line under that. Now, that will be highly disputed, I'm sure, by some of the people uh, sat next to you, um, that there isn't a turnaround, that people have suffered, that they continue to suffer, and that they just don't feel it. The key kind of testing ground and fighting ground in the election about whether people feel any sense of turnaround. You'll be hearing a lot, I think, from both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor in the coming 48 hours. Faisal, thank you. Well, let's get straight to that then. Uh, Chris, is that the plan? Um, well, I think it's part of the plan. Um, and yes, we are uh, definitely, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the Prime Minister had five key tests that it wants to be tested against and the uh, inflation figures and uh, the economy figured in three of them. Uh, and so very important to deliver on that because you've got to <coughs> demonstrate delivery to gain trust, to gain um, people's uh, votes. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something, Chris, and you, uh, you said earlier, Laura, about local elections rarely being about uh, foreign affairs because that's just not the case, is it? Because in local elections in the last decade, it's been a reflection of how well UKIP are going to do in lots of seats up and down the country. And in Newcastle and Sunderland and in my seat, um, you know, where you know, could UKIP do really well in, in those things? So I think there's each, each of those results we've had so far demonstrates something slight, slightly different. And actually, if you were to... I mean, I've just been getting some messages in from good conservative activ activists in Newcastle who are not having the best of nights, but neither is Labour. Um, because, I, look, I mean, I think one of the lessons we're going to learn from tonight is you should um, never write off the Green Party in these, in these situations. I think they're going to have a very strong showing. So there's a lot of things for major parties to learn from these elections. And if we don't learn, then we, 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 you know, we will be punished by the electorate. And what do you mean by that? Well, so we have to continue on the, on the trajectory of delivering so people can believe that we are going to, we'll, we'll do what we, we will say and that, um, that they'll be better off in the, in the long run. Um, but we also have to make sure that we have delivered on the five pledges that uh, uh, the Prime Minister set out. And as we talked about earlier, stopping the boats and, and getting those numbers down is really important in that, in that space. And so immigration policy is going to be a key factor in that. Um, and trying to have a grown-up debate about immigration without going, uh, going um, into extremes is a very um, uh, important on us all to make sure we can have that debate, represent people's views appropriately, um, um, but not... Um, allow the extremes to take over. Do you think that's been happening? No, not yet. But I think, uh, you know, it's, um, I think it's very important that, uh, that major political parties uh, reflect on uh, language in this space. Who are you thinking of? Well, I mean, I, I'm actually thinking of West Streeting, to be quite frank, who I think was a disgrace a couple of days ago. Um, 
when he called a conservative candidate a white supremacist or equated her with it. Um, and I just think you've got to be very careful about that sort of language in the mainstream. Jonathan, do you want to respond to that? Well, first of all, I think it's genuinely remarkable to have a, a major party candidate for a position like Mayor of London who has, for instance, you know, praised Enoch Powell. I mean, it, 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 to me, I just cannot fathom, Chris, the decisions the Conservative Party made around its candidate selection. But that is for you, you and we will, we will yeah. see uh, the results you supported Boris Johnson. I mean, still we do. could keep... Uh, you still do, I know. Yeah, that's absolutely. that's Rishi's problem, isn't it, in no, many ways? No, but, no. I mean, look, on the point on, on the economy that... that <laughs> if he gets to vote... Uh, oh, the points that Faisal was making there. I mean, look, at the next election, the British people will be worse off than they were at the last election. That, that, that's the context they will look at that in. They will look at their public services where the NHS has record waiting lists, where their train to work doesn't arrive, where their kids' school might have been closed at the start of the term for, for you know, the concrete issue. The sense that nothing is working in Conservative Britain, and it's not two or three years, it's 14 years. Like, you can't get away from the fact you've been in power for 14 years. That is the record you will be judged upon. And I think, you know, in all the places I've been to on the campaign trail, I'm heartened to see just how many Conservative supporters, former Conservative supporters, are, are coming to Labour. But to be honest, the scale of the dissatisfaction of Conservative voters, because, I mean, you know, some will go to reform, some will go to green, as you've said, that is a very significant driver of, of how these contexts, contests are going to, to go. And again, you know, you're right to say, I think, that smaller parties tend to do, do better in, in local elections. That's a feature. Of course, that's why you can't really compare, you know, the vote share today to what you would have seen pre-1997 or, or, you know, when you do those comparisons there. No, but we there. can compare it to last year mm. and to 2021. And so but, far tonight, if you're saying the scale of dissatisfaction with the Conservatives is so enormous, you can feel it everywhere you go, but the scale of the change in share since last year, so far, is tiny. That's last not a great endorsement for you. Last year has got to be the you. floor for the Conservative Party, surely. I mean, last year, their own expectation management was to pretend they thought they could lose as many as 1,000 seats. I'm talking about the change in your share. I'm talking about the change in your share. I know, but the Conservative Party, we're not in midterms anymore. This is election year. Surely we expect to see the Conservative Party doing better than last year. Well, I think they some can't people do might worse. think you I mean, expect to see the Labour Party doing well, better this year. Well, I mean, what we have seen on the vote shares, if they are the same, is Labour winning seats from the Conservative Party that we've never held before. So I mean, well, like a massive peddling back on expectation management from, from Labour that we, uh, from where we were two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, which just demonstrates actually how much things can change in the course of an election. Well, but, Lord, I mean, you, you went to Rushmore, I think, there when mm -hmm. you were doing the early rounds. There's never been a majority Labour administration there. You're saying that might happen tonight. So I think, you know, let's be clear at the scale of what we're seeing here. Look at those seats, Wellingborough and places like that, that Labour is winning by-elections. And, of course, we'll see in, in Blackpool South a really significant Well, Labour, Labour are also losing seats to Greens and Independents in South Tyneside, you know, wonderful part of the world, just near near Newcastle. Now, that's, there's no danger that they'll lose the council. But, you know, we are seeing Labour not gaining in places where, if you really are on course for a massive majority, you should be taking. Well, we'll, 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 I mean, let's not talk about massive majorities, you know. <laughs> where Labour has to come from even to be competitive in the mm -hmm. next general election is a most extraordinary measure. The fact we're talking about Labour doing that is testament to what Labour has done in the last few years, and we're very proud of that. But wherever we have seen a Labour and Conservative head-to-head, -head, which will be the choice at the general mm -hmm. election, I think we could be heartened by that. And yes, there will be some contests tonight. I don't think, you know, if you look at the scale of what would be required to win uh, the Tees Valley, I think you talked about before, that is very, very hard. But what we would want and, to see... And Bridget Phillipson has managed that exactly, expectation yeah, for, our, view, for our viewers already. What we would want to see is a red car, a Stockton, um, a Hartlepool. It would be a Labour MP at the next election. Okay. That, that would be the test. OK, well, let's go to one of those places. You've conveniently teed that up for us. Um, let's go to Bolton, which has been run as a Labour minority council. Their boundary changes there this year in terms of the council, but Bolton North East and Bolton West are Conservative held at the moment in terms of the Westminster constituency, and they should both be Labour targets when we get to the general election. So, Kevin Fitzpatrick has been looking very closely for us at what's been going on there so far tonight. Kevin, what can you tell us? Well, Labour need to gain three councillors tonight to take full control of this authority. They've been running it as a minority administration for the past year. In the few years before that, it was a minority administration led by the Conservatives with support from some of the hyper-local parties around here. And Labour had such a good year last year when the councillors were all out that they're defending 11 seats out of the 20 tonight. And they say that's been their focus to defend and to retain those seats. They are potentially hoping to make some gains, though, 
and if they do those would likely come from the Conservatives and if they do pick up those seats from the Conservatives then the Tories here are saying that would be a severe blow and a real indication of, of a, a poor night in terms of prospects wider because they are Conservative strongholds but it is being talked about tonight like these two two of the council seats where Labour have never held them that they could uh, potentially take them. Beyond that um, the Workers' Party of Britain have a couple of candidates here. George Galloway clearly talking the talk um, in Rochdale and in the boroughs around here. There's no real expectation that they're going to have a big impact but in the last decade or so hyper-local parties mainly on the edge of, of this borough have had an increasing impact. They've been the um, kingmakers in the last few years with the Conservatives and they're certainly going to play their part as well, tapping into that sense of frustration that we found in, in this area that there's a feeling that the people on the outside of the borough feel that all the money and the focus tends to be on the town centre and around there. So no dramatic change is expected tonight. Labour could take full control and if they do, that would be considered a really successful night for them. And just to go back to then the, the threat from the workers party of great britain and george galloway's um supporters how much do you feel kevin observing these things how much change do you think that has made to the picture the overall picture where you are well if you look at bolton it seems to have had little impact at all but just down the road in rochdale clearly that's where george galloway won that eventful by-election back in january he's fielding 13 candidates in the local elections there and talking up his chances of of sweeping change through the town hall as he's kept saying the reality is though the expectation on the ground is that potentially pick up between two and six seats there in the areas around the town centre with a large proportion of Muslim voters in those wards. Next door in Oldham though, the issue of Gaza, not necessarily George Galloway, but the issue of Gaza could see Labour lose control of that council. It's on a knife edge there. We had half an hour before nominations came in, two Labour councillors defected to an independent group where Gaza is their big focus. And Labour there just needs to lose one councillor tonight and they would lose control of that council, although they would be by some stretch still the largest party. So uh, this is an issue which is it's playing its part here in Greater Manchester, over in East Lancashire, in Pendle and Burnley. Already uh, in the last few months, Labour lost control of those councils when uh, a whole swathe of Labour councillors defected to become independents over the issue of Gaza. So it's certainly going to play its part, but where we're going to see the results come on that are going to be in the counts later on today. Kevin, thank you so much. We'll be back with you later in the night. Fascinating to hear how those enormous international issues have been playing into very local political contests already. Let's take you then to Grimsby, where the Council of North East Lincolnshire is being hard fought. Why so? Well, Labour hoped to make progress there, but the area is currently split between two Conservative MPs and Great Grimsby and Cleethorpes will be a Labour target when we get to that general election, whenever that is. Our man there for us is Tim Iredale, our political editor in that part of the world. Great to talk to you, Tim. What's going on there tonight, then? Laura, I can tell you there are some furrowed Conservative brows here in Grimsby tonight. I think it is fair to say that. In the past few minutes, uh, the Tories have suffered two losses to Labour. Now, going into these elections, the Conservatives had a sizeable majority uh, in control of North East Lincolnshire Council. But the Tories are defending 11 out of the 12 seats up for grabs tonight. And they're not looking confident at retaining many of those seats. So we fully expect that more seats will go from the Tories to Labour and the Conservatives could lose control of the council. It is still likely they will be the largest party here, but North East Lincolnshire could go hung. And the context of all this is that Grimsby, where I am right now, is the classic Red Wall constituency. It was won by the Tories back in 2019 after decades of Labour control, 1945. Tim, and what have the issues been when you've been out and about chatting to people? I mean, what would have been shifting votes? Lots of issues, but I've just spoken to the uh, sitting Conservative MP for Great Grimsby, Leonici, 
uh, and she says it's all about levelling up. Voters are frustrated that they're not seeing the economic changes that they voted for back in 2019. Now, she argues that there has been some investment here in Grimsby and neighbouring Cleethorpes, but nowhere near enough, perhaps, to persuade people to stay loyal to the Conservatives in these local elections. So, levelling up has played out big here. There are lots of empty shops here in Grimsby, and the local MP, the local Tory MP, admits that the, the pace of those changes just haven't happened quick enough. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Really interesting to hear that. We'll be back with you later in the night, but thank you for that so far. Now, it is 1.44 and we can give you some more results of the councils that have been coming through so far. South Tyneside has been held by the Labour Party. It's not a surprise, but we as we've been hearing, the Greens were taking some seats off them and we will be speaking to the Greens later on in the evening, or the morning, I should say. Uh, Newcastle has been held by the Labour Party. We'll hear more from Rita on that in just a second. Chorley, a Labour hold. That's Speaker Hoyle's part of the world. That was never in doubt. Rochford and Essex, though, that stayed a hung council. So maybe later on we'll have a look in detail at how some of the seats changed hands there or did not. But Rochford and Essex has stayed in no overall control. And Sunderland held by Labour. Again, not a surprise, but interesting to look underneath the results. And Broxbourne, as Rita was telling us a bit earlier, is True Blue, a Conservative hold but with a big falling away in terms of the Tory share. But, Rita, let's go inside what's been happening in Newcastle because Labour's held it, but Labor's it's not it. all looking that pretty for them. Absolutely. We've been taking a forensic look at Newcastle, haven't we? And, uh, well, it's a Labour hold, as you can see, although they are still counting. Um, but interesting, the figures behind the overall result, because as you can see, Labour has lost two seats uh, and the Greens have picked up two seats. Lib Dems have picked up one and the independents have lost one. Now let's have a look at what's happened to the vote share. This is again is the change in the last since the last time these seats were fought three years ago. Labour's vote up a little bit, but it's the Greens who are the main beneficiaries here. The Conservatives down by eight percentage points. But the Greens have had a good night in Newcastle. And I can tell you, although the night is young or it's early in the morning, we've still got a lot of results to go. But the Greens at the moment, based on results here and elsewhere, are on course for having their best local election night so far. Their previous record was in 2019. At the moment, based on the results, it looks as if they could be going even better than that. So, uh, um, That'll be good news for them. And I know you're talking to them fairly soon, Laura. We will you, be, so. yeah. Interesting there, Rita, because they had a good year last year mm. too. So they'll be delighted if they can consolidate that and make further gains on that tonight. Chris, just in terms of seeing what's happening mm. in the undergrowth, if you like, with the smaller parties taking ground at the expense of, of Labour in some places, does that surprise you? It's interesting, isn't it? And just picking up on the point about the, the Greens, the Greens have been doing consistently well in local elections for the last four or five years. Um, and it looks like, from, I mean, we are still in the very thinnest of thin pickings, aren't we, in terms of overall <laughs> results? But certainly, Don't look do it at, down. No, no, <laughs> no exactly. Um, you know, they seem to be doing, they seem to be doing well. Uh, again, we've seen as well, haven't we, in these early indications how well it would appear reform are doing as well. Now, that's not wildly atypical in local elections that smaller parties uh, might do uh, relatively well. But I think what's always intriguing is how well they do, given that they don't get as anywhere near as much publicity, particularly as Labour and the, uh, and the Conservatives. And I guess people are voting knowing that they are not selecting who's going to be a national government. They are selecting a... Uh, a local representative. I think what's interesting just so far, Laura, is a sort of summary thought, is that, yes, there is early evidence that the Conservatives might be struggling in places and that Labour are doing relatively well, but not necessarily making a huge leap forward Labour from where they were this time last year, which, given where the opinion polls have been in the last six, seven months, maybe you would expect that to have been the case. As I say... It's remarkably early, though, isn't it? It is very early. And also, I want to remind you about the chronology of the next few days. We are going to be getting more and more council results as we are spend time together towards 6am. But there's going to be the lion's share of them will be tomorrow, mayoral contest, Friday, Saturday, and all the way through till Saturday night. But we are 
before too long, we hope, going to be able to bring you the result of the Blackpool South by-election, which in and of itself is a very, very important result. Um, that will also give us lots of information that will help create the overall picture of all of this. But the chronology of these elections for councils, for police and crime commissioners, for mayors is not just quite lengthy, but also quite complicated. So, you know, in terms of having grand conclusions at this stage, we should be holding our horses. But there is, Jonathan Reynolds, under these results that we have already, really interesting trends. And are you disappointed to see some of what you've seen, whether it's in South Tyneside seats going to the Greens there or Greens and Lib Dems benefiting from Labour in Newcastle? Um, no, to be honest, partly because of the size of the sample. But if you mm -hmm. take that Newcastle graph you just showed, I mean, if you have a situation where your vote share has gone up and you've lost seats, it's about the other votes moving around of the other party. So we don't know very much. I would go back to, to the fact that, first of all, if we had a repeat of what we saw last year, if there's no rallying in the Conservative vote as we get closer to a general election in election year, well, that would be very promising for mm -hmm. Labour. And again, when we get the kind of data which will tell us in those key parliamentary seats, which are Conservative at present, and we want them to be Labour, are we making the inroads into those seats that would return Labour MPs in a Labour government? That is what will satisfy And we can see the there's some pictures of what's going on in Hartlepool. It's a picture of a lovely ship. Of course, Hartlepool, the proud maritime history, and it does appear Labour have told us they're on the ground that they are going to take that council. Um, I mean, that would be terrific. You've told that us you'd be... be but, it, but it's a no-brainer for you, though, to be taking Hartlepool at this stage. It's, if it's, this it's honestly not a no-brainer. People talk about, quite rightly, Labour's turnaround since 2019. Let's just go back to the Hartlepool by-election. I mean, I'm not from that bit of the northeast, and there's a lot of rivalry in the northeast. but I grew up, you know, in Sunderland, and I'm walking around Hartlepool, and it was tough. It was really, really tough, that contest. We had very few councillors on the ground. Actually, I was shocked by actually how, how that base, that Labour base, had been eroded over time. To be sitting here on the kind of results that we've seen, to see Hartlepool being a Labour council again, that really is a significant turnaround. You, and you, you don't get it, you know, by, by just the votes coming to you because they're unhappy with the Conservative Party. There's a complex situation there. It stands as a testament to how Labour has turned itself around, how we've turned ourselves around over the last few years. Uh, Chris, oh. Sorry to chip in, Louis. Isn't that, though, proof of just how far you fell in the past rather than necessarily how much progress you've made relative to where you need to get to? Well, it's, it's both. I mean, the base we're starting from, Chris, not an easy one. I mean, people, when I'm going around my own constituency today, remind me that in 2019, when that exit poll hit, you know, my own constituency was on that list of northern seats that looked like it might be going Conservative for the first time. So the scale is very, very challenging. But the seats we have won, particularly in those by-elections, beyond our wildest dreams. Let's, let's be frank about that. Seats that are not even ones Labour would need to hold to form a majority government in the House of Commons. You're way beyond those expectations. And then, of course, we factor in things like Scotland, where we've seen a particularly significant turnaround in Labour's fortunes. I think the job that, that Labour, that we've been able to do, is very, very significant in just three years. OK. Chris Eaton harris we heard there from our, uh, Tim Aradale on the ground who was saying he'd been chatting to Leah Nietzsche. Now, she's one of your colleagues, a Conservative MP for part of Grimsby, and she was acknowledging to people there tonight that levelling up has not been what it promised, hasn't gone fast enough. The things that were vowed to people have not all materialised. What do you say to that? Is well, she wrong? You can't turn around... Um, 30, 40 years of <coughs> labour underfunding of these areas in four or five years. And there has been significant progress. Um, but people are rightly demanding to see more. And I believe they'll, uh, they will see it being delivered. I mean, just to go on, on Jonathan's point, this set of elections in 2021, my party was in the 40% um, mark in national polling. It was, uh, I think one of your uh, colleagues called it the vaccine bounce. Um, election for the Conservatives. We were, uh, we were definitely riding high and we took Hartlepool um, in, in, in that thing. We are definitely not in that same position at this point. And um, whilst I, I'm obviously disappointed that we're losing counts, uh, we, we've lost mm -hmm. 12 good councillors so far, um, but it doesn't strike me that this is uh, a massive a great day for Labour so far, but it's so such a small sample. when you come to your sample. own party, is, is, yeah. isn't the truth, though, actually, if you've just said yourself, you've just admitted you were more popular under Boris Johnson? Yeah, but there are a whole host of factors in that, coming out of COVID definitely being one. Uh, I was in a business in Northern Ireland um, earlier today who uh, wanted to thank um, uh, Rishi Sunak for the furlough scheme. Um, because uh, and, uh, because without that, they said they would have would have gone under. They wouldn't be in existence today. There are a whole host of factors that were in play in 2021, mostly around the pandemic uh, and the government's handling. And um, 
and uh, the vaccine uh, rollout, um, which we are rightly proud of. But the problem for you is that voters liked you more then when you had a different leader under Boris Johnson. He was a close ally of yours. He said he's still a good Conservative. Very clearly, you are far less popular than you were then. We are 14 years into a Conservative government and we've so got a lot to do. So it's inevitable then? Well, elements of it are in when you're uh, at this stage, but we, de we definitely need to earn the trust of voters who are, I would say, ambivalent about us at this point in time. They're ambivalent. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, Chris Eaton Harris, we are grateful for your time tonight. We're going to say goodbye to you now. Miraculously, you're going to morph into Mark Harper, the Transport <laughs> Secretary, but we're grateful to you My for pleasure. your time tonight. And let's take you then back to what is one of the first big contests of the night. I think those pictures there are of the count in Hartlepool. Oh, where someone at the lectern is telling us something. Let's listen in. Corinne Mill, Labour and Cooperative Party, 919 votes. David Nicholson, Local Conservatives, 339. There were, 20, there were 12 void or um, 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 unmarked uh, ballot papers. Therefore, Corinne Mill, can I ask you to come forward in the junior letter? Of one ward there in Hartlepool Council. Labour has told us on the ground there they think they're going to take Hartlepool. Jonathan Reynolds has been telling us here that that is something that they are going to be absolutely delighted about. Um, that overall result from Hartlepool, though, is not yet there and confirmed. So I think what we were just hearing there was the result of one ward um, that was being Absolutely. announced as the night goes on. But as soon as we have an official result in Hartlepool, we will let you know. But it's good to hear returning officers giving us updates, even if it was rather hard to hear. However, let's hear and listen with careful attention to our colleague Helen Catt. Now, Helen, you are at one of the big stories of the night. We don't know which way it's going to go in Blackpool South in the by-election, although you were already telling us a couple of hours ago, Labour seems pretty sure of taking it, but the contest is between second, the Tories for, for second place. But can you give us an update, at least on when we might get the result? <laughs> I really wish I could, Laura, <laughs> but at this stage, they still haven't started counting any votes here in Blackpool South. They're still on verification. They've just called all the candidates to the table over there to, to solve some sort of issue. We don't know what that is yet. We're just trying to find out what's going on. But yes, at the moment, not a single vote has been counted here. So we're expecting this to be quite a late one. But as you said, uh, there are expectations. Labour very confident that they are going to win this. Other parties also think Labour have got this, quite frankly. So that is the expected result that we're, we're thinking we're going to get but whatever time it comes uh, in the morning and then what is less clear is what's happening with the other parties uh, Labour um, the Reform and the Conservatives are both saying that initially at the start of the night that they thought that it would be the Conservative second and Reform probably was still going to be in third but in recent hours Reform think they've done slightly better than they thought they had in particularly oh, yeah, in poster yeah, yeah, votes yeah, yeah. oh hang on I think we're getting uh... aha I don't know if you heard that. That is progress. The count is starting, finally, here in Blackpool South. Well, we can all cheers that, <laughs> Helen. We can cheer that with our cups of tea here. So the <laughs> counting will begin. The verification is complete. But fascinating what you were saying, though, earlier. We had a chat with Mark Butcher, the reform candidate, who said he seemed to think that actually being in second place <laughs> might be an option for him. He sounded very, very optimistic, perhaps more optimistic than he was at the beginning of the night. What is it, do you think, that uh, is making the Conservatives think there they might have been squeezed into second place? Into third place, rather. Well, I think it is into third place. Well, the Conservatives, when I was speaking to them earlier, still thought they were hanging on to, to second place. It's more just that Reform think that they've looked at when they've started to see the sampling that's been done here, that they think that uh, they performed better, particularly in the postal ballots, than they thought they had previously. Reform are also saying that they thought they'd performed very well with actual in-person voters today. But until we start to, to get the counting fully underway, I think there may be a slightly clearer picture of that will emerge. OK, Helen, thank you very much indeed. And wave at us if there seems to be more progress. So we're glad, at the very least, that the hard-working counters in Blackpool can now actually get on with the important next bit of the task. Helen, will talk to you a bit later on in the programme. Let's just quickly have a chat then with Mo Hussein, who used to work as a Conservative Special Advisor. Thank you for your patience and hanging on to speak to us tonight. Hi, um, it sounds there, from what Helen was telling us, that the Conservatives may well end up in third place, 
in the Blackpool South by-election. We're not confirming that, but that seems to be the way mm. that it is going, according to our uh, intelligence on the ground. If that happened, what would be the reaction of the Conservative Party that you know and understand so well? Well, it would be hugely concerning. MPs are already jittery and they have been for a while and there's a real prospect of a pincer movement. So Labour uh, from the left and then reform from the right. And if reform end up polling uh, well and get an increased vote share, then uh, the pressure will be will be on again. And I think that leads to, uh, on the Prime Minister that is, and that leads to quite an ex existential question for the party in terms of do they move more towards the right? And you've seen in the last week or so this choreography of announcements uh, from number 10, the red meat around welfare reform, uh, around Rwanda passing uh, in, in the Commons and around defence spending. Or do they try and appeal more to the mainstream and capture some of the voters uh, that they may lose from 2019? So I think it does cause uh, a lot more problems for number 10. And in terms of what they could do to try to rectify that, what would you be saying if you were still working for them in government? Well, it is really, really, really challenging because you have to make a decision and each decision you make, somebody is going to get annoyed. And you've seen this uh, movement from the Prime Minister where he has tried to go more to the right and therefore you alienate 